The best place to hide the truth is in the pages of a book. just read maybe we should just read Welcome to Hayes Reviews. Yes, indeed. Hello and good evening. It is very good to have you here. This is Hayes Reviews, as you just heard in that little intro clip there. Uh, the guitar music you've been listening to, that is all arranged, composed, created and recorded and performed by me. And so I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, and as you might have read on the waiting screen there, uh, if you are interested in more of that and you want to make an exchange, I would like to uh, make you the offer of a download link to get a full bundle of that music. It's three hours worth of music in total uh, recorded over the last ooh, nine years. Uh, and it's not professionally recorded. It's not professionally anything. It's just me and what I've come up with, you know, in my spare time and recorded on my iPhone. But it's authentic and it is done with love and it is not to be found anywhere else on the internet because I've been carrying it around in my voice memos app on my phone for the last nine years. <laughs> Uh, and then I just suddenly had the idea, well, I could use this on my uh, YouTube channel. And uh, and then I thought, well, well, you know, I could bundle it together in a little zip file and uh, and offer that to people. And so if you're interested in staying in contact, you can send me an email and uh, I will add that to the Haze Reviews mailing list. That will help us uh, have a little bit of a hedge against censorship just in case the channel ever gets wiped out, which is entirely possible, let's be honest. If it does get wiped out and I have your email address, then I can let you know uh, where I will move to. Uh, I'll pop up somewhere else. I will not give up if this channel gets wiped out. Of course I will not. But uh, if I don't have your email address, then I can't tell you where I've gone. <laughs> and you might be uh, left with a little hole in your life where Hayes Reviews used to be. And we wouldn't want that, would we? Uh, so that's the offer at the moment. If you want to send an email address, you can do so. Uh, an email to me, you can do so. I'll keep your address on file and I'll send you back a download link. It's only 123 megabytes. So it's quite a small download. Shouldn't eat up your bandwidth. And you'll have over three hours of uh, authentic, uh, unique Hayes Reviews guitar and music. So how about that? If that sounds good, you know what to do. So we've got Frank, Heidi, we've got Electro Mata, and we've got Richard. Good evening to you all in the chat. Good evening to those of you who are not in the chat as well. So um, I think by now, I don't need to go on too much of an introductory and a, and a, and a um, explanation of why we're here and what we're doing. This is part 11 in our reading of the story of the Rockefeller Foundation. So I think if you're tuned in right now, you've probably seen some of the previous videos in this series. We're just reading the book cover to cover and we're just discovering the incredible things that Raymond B. Fosdick, the first president of the Rockefeller Foundation, admits to. And it's pretty enlightening. It's it's incredible where the, the they openly admit the money is going. Uh, and this is things like the Tavistock Clinic. It's going to the Galton Laboratory of Eugenics. It's going to the Council on Foreign Relations, the Royal Institute for International Affairs. It's going to Alfred Kinsey, and it's going to China. It's also going to the scientists who developed, who worked in the Manhattan Project and developed the atomic bomb, if you believe in such things. So um, it, yeah, it's been, it's been fantastic. The last two chapters we read on Saturday, just gone, uh, were all about social sciences, which uh, we've been kind of reading as social engineering, right? Because why would you want to study society unless you wanted to control it? And that is the word that Raymond Fosdick himself used in the book. It's all about figuring out and coming up with a perfect science of human psychology and human behavior in order to regulate it, in order to make it 
the same across the board to homogenize it in other words. And, and, uh, and, and he just kind of openly just admits it right here in this book. Excuse me there. I've got a bit of a, a bit windy today for some reason. Uh, and when I say this book, that's this book right here. So let's get into it. Tonight, we're going to do another two chapters. And I do have a brief bit of preamble for you. So we're going to, oh, and good evening, Gwen. Good to have you here. So we're going to jump right into it. Let's have a look. So the first thing I wanted to mention is that I have uh, designed and then enlisted the, the help of a wonderful friend to create this banner, the new banner at the top of the YouTube channel. And that lays out the schedule that we're going to be live streaming to, uh, which is Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, 7 p.m. And that is UK time for those of you who are not in the same time zone as me. Uh, bear that in mind when you're calculating what time you need to show up. I think if you're in America, you're going to be somewhere between five, six, seven or eight hours behind me. So it's going to be kind of maybe late morning, lunchtime, afternoon-ish for you. So maybe if you've got a job that allows you to stick some headphones in while you're uh, carrying that out, maybe uh, put a loudspeaker on in the background while you're doing your work, then uh, that would be a good thing if you want to get learnified while you're doing your, uh, your uh, earning your daily bread, let's say. Okay. So you've got the uh, the banner there and CESP has spotted the 777. Yeah, I, I don't know why, but it appealed to me to keep it at the same time and then to have this like triple seven thing going on. I think it gives good vibes, good energy. I'm not a numerologist, but I was saying to my wife the other day that the triple seven, the only time we ever really see it in culture is, uh, is to signify winning the jackpot, isn't it? So... Uh, <laughs> You know, you don't really see 777 anywhere else. There's 77. You know, there was an event on uh, the uh, the seventh day of the seventh month here in London. Uh, but that was only two sevens. But three sevens, I think that's good. Uh, you know, it's one up from the, the triple six, which is obviously bad. <laughs> so so hopefully uh, that will give us good energy, good vibes. It'll catch people's eye and it'll, it'll uh, anchor in their mind when we are doing what we do here, which is explore and enjoy uh, books you know, if I had to put it into a sentence. So I wanted to just draw people's attention to that and let you know that that is a schedule moving forward. It's been a good schedule for the last two weeks now. I think we've done this. Uh, so I think it's sustainable and I think we can keep going with it. So how about that? Heidi says seven represents wholeness. Yeah. Seven uh, also is three plus four. And uh, I heard somewhere recently, I forget where, uh, like these numbers such as three, 34, for example, or 23 or 45, where you've got, you know, the sequ the numbers that are sequential coming one after the other. So three, then four, 34 is, is like a builder number. It kind of signifies progress and, and movement up and, uh, and kind of ascension maybe. I don't know. I'm not a numerologist, like I said, but three plus four is 34 is one of those numbers. And then three plus four gives you the seven. And then you've got uh, a, a seven, seven, seven. So, and, and 7 p.m. works perfectly for me because I like to go to bed around uh, half nine, ten. <laughs> so that's another reason why I went for that time too. And then seven is the lucky number. Yeah, lucky number seven. That's also what they say. So anyway, that's enough about the banner. But there it is. Uh, and you can, uh, you know, enjoy that because uh, a lot of, uh, quite a bit of time went into the design of that and a few different iterations and versions of it. And I went backwards and forwards and now I'm really happy with how it looks. So there it is. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go over here for a second and mute my, uh, laptop speakers and then I'll come back over here to talk to you. So this other thing is a poll that I put out on the telegram group. So this poll is because, uh, we are coming to the end of the Rockefeller foundation. We will probably wrap it up on Thursdays, no, on Saturday's broadcast. Uh, and so it's time to choose what is the next book. Now I'm, Intending Hayes Reviews to be uh, an, an interactive thing where, you know, the listeners, the viewers, the audience, the people who are interested in, in these books get to have some kind of steer on where the ship goes, the good ship Hayes Reviews. Uh, and so I've put this poll out. I've picked three books and I've put this poll out for people to uh, to weigh in on and say what they want us to read next. Uh, and so these are the results as it stands today. I'm going to leave this up all week. We can harvest and gather a few more votes. But... The three books that I picked were uh, a, this book, Roads, by Sarah Gertrude Millen. Uh, this is a 1933 book. And if we pop here over to the book cam, uh, which is this one, it's kind of bright, but you can go down here. This, this, is, uh, this is the Sarah Gertrude Millen book. 
It is an old one. It is 1933. It's got these kind of like messed up pages on the bottom there that you can't really see because it's too bright. One of the interesting uh, features of this book is in the front page. It actually has a picture of uh, Cecil Rhodes, his, 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 his death mask. And he died really young. He was like in his 40s or something. So this is a 1933 book. Uh, let me readjust this light because I think it's a bit too much, isn't it? 1933 book, Rhodes. And I picked this one up for £3.49. <laughs> Come on, look at that. First edition, someone's penciled in there. £3.49. Just incredible what you can get if you search the uh, secondhand bookshops. So that was option one. And I'll be, I'll be honest, it's, it's, uh, it's actually, it's, it's done pretty well. It's come second place. So, uh, so far, it's in second place, I should say. So the second option was Rockefeller Internationalist, The Man Who Misrules the World by Emmanuel Josephson. And this one is a really, this one was actually recommended to me by Amazon. You know, it said, oh, you know, you might like this thing. And, and so I grabbed it and it's, uh, I got a good deal on it because uh, this guy's books are actually quite pricey. And the author, I can show you on the inside here, is uh, Emmanuel M. Josephson. There's a lot of books, uh, other ones he's done. Nearsightedness is preventable. Merchants in medicine. Your life is their toy. That one looks very, very interesting. Uh, breathe deeply and avoid colds. The strange death of Franklin D. Roosevelt. So keep an eye out for this man if you've never heard of him. I think it's a man, isn't it? Emmanuel. Uh, definitely be worth getting some of his books if you can find them uh, and uh, preserve them. And this one looks very interesting too. So this is kind of the other side of the Rockefellers. We're getting uh, the official, authorized, accepted story from the president. I think this writer has put together something that's a little more critical, a little more revealing, uh, and probably has a little more truth in it as well, I would wager. And then, last but not least... And racing out in front with 53% of the vote is Fabian Freeway by Rose L. Martin. Now, I wasn't going to show too much about this one right now, but I'm going to do it because I'm just excited. This is actually one of, one of my favorite books in my whole collection. And uh, you can see the spine there, Fabian Freeway. I didn't know about it. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how I found out about it if we end up reading it. But I'll show you why it's one of my favorite books. One, it's just a really nice copy. It hasn't, the, the, the pages are still like the right shape. <laughs> and it's got this kind of like musty book smell, but it's not dampy. It doesn't have like a damp and mold sort of smell to it. You know, it's, it's, it's obviously been in a place that's been properly, you know, the humidity has been good and uh, it's got that old like musty book, but not kind of, you know, I don't feel like it's going to give me an asthma flare up. <laughs> And you can see here that I actually did splash out a bit for this one. It was 57 pounds. But, 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 look what it is. It has been signed by Rose L. Martin herself to Carol. And I think that's Jean uh, Saber, maybe. Sab. With every good wish, Rose L. Martin. Santa Maria. September, which is a good year. That's uh, my, I was born in September. 1969. And then again, front page there. Fabian Freeway, The High Road to Socialism in the USA, 1884 to 1966. So look at that time period as well, you know, uh, end of the 19th century, encompassing World War I, World War II. Um, I'm very excited to get into this one if, if it is voted in as the book that we are going to read. Because it it's not over yet, right? There's still a race. Votes can still be counted. Uh, and it's not over till the fat lady sings, as they say. Um, but I'm very excited for this. So if you're interested in taking part, you can join the Telegram group, cast a vote in there. Uh, that is the way to do that. Currently, there's no other way to vote. This is just a Telegram only feature and function. Uh, and even if you type in the chat what you'd like to see, there's no way for me to alter the votes. It's one person, one vote. And Telegram's pretty good for for monitoring that and and making sure people don't cheat unless they have multiple uh, accounts on, on different devices. But I don't think anyone cares so much about this show yet that they would go to such lengths to influence the outcome. <laughs> so that is the other thing that I wanted to mention. Uh, right. 
let's carry on with a bit of preamble. So, last uh, last week we got to reading about institutions that were funded by the Rockefellers, and this one popped up, and I this this caught my eye, uh, and I explained about why, and so we did a little bit of looking into it uh, on the previous broadcast, but I didn't get all the way through this. Um, this article, which is a, just a Wikipedia page. I didn't get all the way through it. So I thought we'd just go back and finish this off. We actually, uh, we, we stopped about here. We were looking at some of the presidents and none of these names really stood out to me. Uh, Steiner, but I don't think that would be related to Rudolph, but you never know. Uh, so I thought we'd, we'd just finish this off and uh, have a little, uh, another little saunter as well, looking at uh, some of the other, um, uh, one other, in fact, uh, think tank that is funded by the Rockefellers. But for the Brookings Institute, they've got research programs. And it did say at the top that the, the, these there's three arms to the Brookings Institute, and one of them's in China, the other one's in Qatar. Uh, so it's got its uh, Center for Middle East Policy, and it's also got its Brookings Tsinghua Center for Public Policy, and that it was a partnership between Brookings Institute in Washington and the University School of Public Policy and Management in Beijing, China. And so uh, it's very relevant because, you know, managing the public, these these kind of people who go into this sort of thing, who set these power structures up around us is really, um, they, it, it, it comes from such a place of arrogance and hubris. And we have to manage those little people down there. We have to tell them what to do, where to go, how to think, uh, what they can and can't do, put the laws in place, police them, monitor them, track them, surveil them uh, and keep them under control. And uh, in this this public policy, this obsession with gathering the information and and running things uh, is is really what is being funded in a broad sense from by the Rockefeller Foundation. So it's no surprise that this is what Brookings Institute is into, and uh, that it's being funded by the Rockers. Twenty first Century Defense Initiative is another thing that the Brookings Institute does. This is aimed at producing research, analysis, and outreach that address the three core issues, which is the future of war. So not the prevention of war, you know, not the not the de-arming of, of the world, not the not the um, getting rid of all the weapons of mass destruction. And no, 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 it's the future of war, the future of U.S. defense needs and priorities and the future of U.S. defense system. So uh, a lot of money and uh, effort and energy and attention going into war from the Brookings Institute. A little section here as well about funders, which was quite revealing. The uh, Brookings Institute has assets of $524.2 million, and its largest contributors include the Bill and Melinda Foundation. Ooh, bet nobody's shocked to find that out. JP Morgan Chase and the Lego Foundation. That one I was surprised about. I don't know what the Lego Foundation is, and there's no page here on, in Wikipedia about it. So that one might be a good one to look into and... Uh, the state of Qatar as well is also funding this um, this particular think tank. And if you look at their funding details as of 2017, most of the pie is grants, contracts, and contributions. Funding controversies was an interesting section because it tells us here that a 2014 investigation by the New York Times found the Brookings Institute to be among more than a dozen Washington research groups and think tanks to have received payments from foreign governments while encouraging American government officials to support policies aligned with those foreign government's agendas. So are your, are your um, politicians working for you? Are they trying to help you? Are they really trying to do what's best for your country and your nation? Or, you know, are they being um, advised by people who are being funded by other nations and governments from, from, from outside? Right. Very strange, but interesting admission in, a, in the mainstream Wikipedia here. Uh, it also tells us that several legal specialists who examined the documents told the paper that the language of the transactions, quote, appeared to necessitate Brookings filing as a foreign agent under the Foreign Agent Registration Act. That's quite a damning um, thing to discover, I would say, that the... Transactions suggest the Brookings Institute should actually be is, is is operating as a foreign agent. 
the Qatari government, named by the New York Times as the single biggest foreign donor to Brookings, reportedly made a $14.8 million four-year contribution in 2013. So that's huge, huge money there. Brookings received the third highest amount of funding from outside the US compared to other think tanks. The third highest, so not even the top. That's, there's, there's other, that means there's, other, there's two other think tanks in the US which are getting more funding from outside the country than this one. Uh, and this one's getting 27 mil. <laughs> and then interestingly as well, in 2022, the president, John R. Allen of Brookings Institute, resigned amid an FBI probe into lobbying on behalf of Qatar. So how about that? So these guys are getting a lot of money and a lot of funding from other countries and other places run by a totally different culture, people with a different framework of reference, with a different philosophy and religious ideas. They're funding the think tank, which is then informing and guiding the politicians in America. How do you feel about that if you're American? Uh, how do you feel about that if you're English? You probably don't care until you read about Chatham House. <laughs> So Chatham House was also mentioned in the Rockefeller Foundation book that we're reading uh, as, as receiving grants from, from the Rockefellers. But if you do a control F search on the Wikipedia page, the Rockefellers are not mentioned. In fact, come to think of it, let's go back one. I'm not sure if the Rockefellers are mentioned. Yeah, they are mentioned here. Yeah, we, we covered that last week. So at least uh, the Brookings Institute has a mention of Rockefeller, but the Chatham House, no mention of Rockefeller. Uh, so this is a British think tank based in London, and its stated mission is to help governments and societies build a sustainably secure, prosperous, and just world. Uh, they're very big into the sustainable aspect of this effort. Uh, the overview that uh, tells us that this is the head, the Chatham House is the headquarters of the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and uh, this property was secured by Canadian philanthropists. Lieutenant Colonel Reuben Wells Leonard and Kate Rowlands Leonard, uh, which was, and, and they donated this property. And uh, that's another interesting pair of philanthropists or philanthropaths to look into. I've never heard of them before. It's the origin of the Chatham House rule, which dictates that you may talk about what is discussed inside the meetings there, but you may not say who attended the meeting and who said what. Uh, and this uh, this is a way to allow for frank and honest discussion on controversial or unpopular issues. Um, but it says also that most meetings at Chatham House are held on the record and not under the Chatham House rule. Uh, so that's reassuring then, isn't it? No secrets, nothing to be worried about. Just those crazy conspiracies, theorists uh, banging on their drums for no reason. The research and publications, this was quite telling. There's five thematic programs that the research of this of this place uh, focuses on, which is environment and society, right? So that's your uh, sustainability, that's your worship of, of Gaia, uh, worship of um, nature, seeing humans as just another animal in nature with no right, no more right to to uh, to live the way they do than any other animals. Just we're just another animal, and we need to. We need to get. We need to jettison our way of life and our material comforts because we're doing too much damage to to Gaia and the planet and all the precious animals and the environment here. And we are doing a lot of damage to it, right? But the measures that are being proposed, as I've covered in uh, other live streams on this channel, um, I did one called the Green Queen Climatriarch, talking about this. The measures being proposed do not address the the, the actual problems and the problems that we are told are the problems are just a kind of smoke screen to roll out more technocratic control, more data surveillance of us uh, and more ridiculous kind of things like digital money and digital ID and all these things that nobody wants, but people will sleepwalk into because they're just, you know, oblivious for the most part. So that's the first thing that they're into is environment and society. Then it's the global economy and finance. So that's getting into your globalism. And then what we'll find a little bit later is that there's a big overlap between Chatham House and organizations such as the IMF, such as the World Bank. Um, and so they, they're looking at the, this globalization of finance, uh, which is the kind of central thesis of Quigley's Tragedy and Hope, talking about this financial elite who want to set up a worldwide banking system that is run from the uh, spider's web, which is the Bank for International Settlements. So global economy and finance is number two on their list. Next is global health security. Well, really, uh, just look at the events of the last four years, right? 
and then it's international law, and then it's international security. So they're looking at the big picture. These 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 people. There's six thousand of them. I was going to say these boys, but there's there's non boys in there as well. Uh, these people, they are they're looking at the big picture. They're looking at the international um, interweaving and interlocking of systems to to what to do what to do what end right. Uh, they've got a they've got a sustainability accelerator, which just sounds cool, but probably just means how can we wreck your standard of living faster. And they've got periodical publications, uh, which is this mainly this journal, International Affairs, which they've been put, pumping out for a year, uh, sorry, a century at this point. And they are probably valuable, I guess. Uh, I know Heidi was telling us today that she used to read that. And I was uh, saying that I hope she has kept some of those copies lying around because I bet they're valuable and interesting to look at, especially the ones that, you know, the older they are for sure. And then there was this one, the Chatham House Prize, which we briefly looked at uh, last broadcast and I compared it to the Charlemagne prize which is very uh, enlightening to look at who that's been awarded to this one hasn't been going quite as long uh, this started in 2005 but it's been given to Hillary Clinton uh, it's been given to the co-founder of the the Bill and Melinda Foundation uh, which is Melinda uh, it's also been given to John Kerry uh, as well as Sir David Attenborough and uh, that's not surprising when you know that they're really into pushing this kind of climate change, sacrifice ourselves on the altar of the Green Queen, which is uh, Gaia, Mother Nature uh, kind of narrative. And then, of course, 2023 obviously had to go to Mr. High Heels uh, himself, Zelensky. Uh, so who's going to get it this year? I bet we can't wait to find out. All right. So the history, the origins... This is uh, the Royal Institute of International Affairs originated in a meeting convened by Lionel Curtis of the American and British delegates to the Paris Peace Conference on the 30th of May 1919. Curtis had long been an advocate for the scientific study of international affairs. So that is very reminiscent of Bertrand Russell, the scientific outlook, has man a future, uh, this push to have a scientific elite run the world. Uh, and then eventually probably, you know, that, that class of scientific elite to be replaced by software. And so that we're all just living in this software, uh, me tech mediated version of reality where everything is track traced and database and controlled centrally by some sort of hyper advanced algorithm. And I refuse to use the two letter acronym that's being banded about all over the place these days, but I think you know what I'm getting at. Uh, so Lionel, Lionel, Lionel Curtis, got this thing kicked off and he was well into the scientific study of international affairs. And that overlaps with, you know, the last two chapters we read from the Rockefeller book about their funding. So uh, no surprises here. Uh, the British and American delegates from the peace conference, uh, they formed separate institutes with the Americans developing the Council on Foreign Relations. So you might as well see the Council on Foreign Relations and the Royal Institute for International Affairs at Chatham House as, you know, two wings of the same bird to two cheeks on the same bottom, uh, if you will. I think it's fair to say um, one's American and one's British, but I'm sure they overlap and work very closely. So we've got uh, the, former, the, foreign, the former foreign secretary, Edward Gray, okay? Uh, we've also got Arthur J., Arthur J. Balfour, who gave his name to the Balfour Declaration. So very, very important names, Lionel Curtis, Edward Gray, Balfour, very important names to understand. They pop up in the some of the books that I've read on this channel, the Hidden History book, the Lord Milner's Second War. They pop up in the Anglo-American establishment. They feature very prominently as well. So these are really key names to know about, to understand, you know, the context and and the the continuity of uh, of me of, of uh, plan planning an effort that goes back. 100 years plus, uh, and is rolled out by the Rockefellers, you know, once they kind of arrive on the scene and start building things with their foundation money. A little bit more about the interwar years. Uh, Arnold Toynbee, uh, after being appointed as Director of Studies, Arnold Toynbee produced the Institute's annual Survey of International Affairs until his retirement in 1955, while providing a detailed annual overview of international relations, the survey's primary role was to record current international history. Now, this is curious. Uh, this this might be where we would see the Rockefellers mentioned because in in the story of the Rockefeller Foundation, Fosdick told us tells us 
that money went to Toynbee for the purpose of writing history books, which would then be used to inform and teach other people. So they literally wrote the history books and it was funded by the Rockefellers and Toynbee is the man who did that. In 1926, 14 members of Chatham House represented the UK at the first conference of the Institute of Pacific Relations, with a special focus being placed upon China's economic development and international relations. So extremely interested in China. You know, why? What could that be? What's the reason for that? Well, if I don't know if uh, people in my audience or watching this video will know or be f so familiar with David Icke and his work, but he one of the things he says, and, and other people are kind of seeing this happen now but one of the things he says is the, the 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 system and the model and the society in china is like a test testing ground for what could be rolled out you know over here in the west specifically with reference to uh technocracy and facial scanning and digital surveillance of everybody at all times and uh social credit system based on your behaviors and your interactions and did you uh, offer did you uh, pay enough to charity? Did you smoke too many cigarettes? Did you play too many computer games? And you got a score and it goes up and down depending on these criteria uh, as to whether you're a good or a bad citizen. This is best seen in the episode Nosedive, by, uh, which is an episode of Black Mirror. Uh, and uh, a girl there has a number. It's a social media app. And everyone you meet will give you a score. Uh, I think it's four stars or five stars. And the more five star interactions you get from people, uh, the more you're average score goes up and that opens up opportunities for things you're able to do, places you can go, high society events. So everyone is like desperately forced uh, with each other because they're all being overly polite and overly friendly in that kind of fake, sickening, sycophantic type of way. You know, like everyone's ass kicking ass kissing and brown nosing each other all the time because they're all trying to get these five star ratings that will boost them up and give them a better social status. And, you know, the clue is in the title. The episode's called Nose Dive. So I'll, I'll leave it to your imagination what happens in that episode. But it is worth watching if you want an idea of where this kind of obsession with smartphones plus social media plus, you know, the credit score. All you need is the credit score to be linked in to that social media which could probably be done. I'm sure the technology already exists. The social credit system's like pretty much half built. They just haven't called, they haven't um, they haven't come out and called it that, right? And I forgot to record this episode again, so I'm going to hit record right now. There we go. That's the one thing I keep forgetting to do at the start of the episodes is hit record. But anyway, so um, that is why I think a lot of attention and focus and money has gone into China because it's kind of a test bed because China's already communist as CESP just pointed out. China was communist. It's like, well, let's, let's roll out some things there, some systems there, see how it goes. You know, let's test a few things. T let's, t let's try a one track child policy and see how that goes. Uh, and it's all testing. It's all, it's all, um, refining, you know, let's try this system over there. Let's try this system over there. And then eventually we'll, we'll kind of merge them together. And I think that was the outcome of the investigation into the foundations was that they found out the Ford Foundation's mandate from the very top, the guy at the top, or one of the guys near the top said our, our mandate was to, was to merge the American system with the, uh, well, that was with the Soviet system, wasn't it? Was that with the Soviet system or the Chinese system? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. I can't remember. But um, that that was uh, somebody in the chat might be able to recall better. I, I want to call, was it the Reese Committee? Jibba Griffin interviewed a guy uh, and um, Dow, Dow, Doid, Norman Dodd, Norman Dodd. <laughs> I'm, I'm, my terrible memory is failing me. But um, this merging of the Chinese system with the, with the Western system, I think we can kind of posit that that is a possible motive for all this investment and attention being played by the foundations and the think tanks, uh, you know, in and on China. So that would be my uh, sort of suggestion for that, uh, for that special focus placed upon China that we just read about there. Okay. So carrying on with Chatham House, further expansion, 1929. So this was very important, interesting. 1929 also saw the inception of the Institute's special study group, on the international gold problem. And that doesn't have a hyperlink, and I don't know what that refers to. Uh, what what is what is the problem? What was the problem? Anyway, whatever the gold, whatever the international gold problem was, it led to the group's research 
anticipating Britain's decision to abandon the gold standard two years later. So that's 1931, Britain decided to abandon the gold standard, which means, which, which is the domin the first domino to fall, which has the knock-on effect and the causality effect, which means there must be at some point some kind of hyperinflationary uh, aspect or, or event uh, or, or some sort of a kind of implosion of the financial system. Because once you untether the fiat currency from something solid, tangible, that there's a limited supply of, then you can just print more and print more and print more and inflate it and inflate it and inflate it. And that has to be the way it goes until eventually the money becomes just, you know, worthless and you carry in wheelbarrow fulls around of it. But I think uh, the plan is to get us all on some sort of digital currency before that happens. So I don't think we'll need to be all going out and investing in wheelbarrows just yet. But interesting that this group was involved in, in uh, this whole um, decoupling of the, of the currency from, from gold. I didn't know about that. And then around this time as well, Chatham House became known as a place for leading statesmen and actors in world affairs to visit when in London. Notably, Mahatma Gandhi visited the Institute and he delivered a talk called The Future of India. And this talk was attended by 750 members, making it the Institute's largest meeting up to that point. And then this bit uh, was very curious, and I'll tell you why. In 1933, Norman Angell, whilst working within the Institute's council, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his book, The Great Illusion, which made him the first and only laureate to be awarded the prize for publishing a book. And that bit stood out to me because I thought, huh, you know what? I have that book. Yes, I do. And uh, it's funny, and this is it. This is my copy of it, The Great Illusion. Uh, and I just bought it because I was, I just thought, huh, it's four ninety nine. look. A study of the relation in military power in nations to their economic and social advantage. And I just grabbed it because it sounded interesting. I'd never heard of the author and I'd never heard of the book. It was just one of those sort of impulse buys. Uh, but the economics of the case, the human nature of the case, the practical outcome, quite detailed uh, chapter breakdowns, which is always, you know, this is how they used to do the, the uh, contents of books. They used to give you one sentence summaries of all the topics and ideas that were contained in each chapter. Uh, when Back when books, you know, people wrote good books that were detailed and helpful and useful and before the internet, in other words. So I have a copy of that. So that's one that we might read on this channel at some point. This is not a first edition, but it is quite old. The book itself was 1911 when it came out. Although on the Wikipedia, it says 1933. So maybe that 1911 is referring to something else. But here it says first published 1909. And this copy is 1911, yeah. So Wikipedia is wrong. And this physical actual book. So that just tells you right there, doesn't it? <laughs> Why the books are so important. Like this is just one example, probably among many, of uh, of, of Wikipedia just lying or or... or <laughs> Mr. Mis uh, you know, it could just be an error. It could be an honest mistake. I'm not ruling that out. That's exact. That's exactly absolutely possible. Before anyone jumps down my throat, oh, it could just be a, <laughs> could just be an honest mistake. That's absolutely true. But that is just to say why it's so important to have the physical copies and to look into the actual artifacts, and uh, that's why I'm so into it. Because you find something like that, it reinforces my sort of commitment to the mission of what we're trying to do here. So yeah. Maybe, uh, you know, if I cared enough about Wikipedia, I would do an edit on that. But I know that this thing is mainly here to deceive and lie to people. So <laughs> I'm not going to invest any time trying to update it and make it true. So the war years for Chatham House. At the outbreak of the Second World War, the Institute was decentralized for security reasons, with many of the staff moving to Balliol College, Oxford. Uh, and so this one comes up quite a lot in the Anglo-American establishment. Oxford, the Anglo-American establishment, they, the Oxford was their kind of recruiting ground. They had a massive influence there, hanging around all the time and uh, trying to find young, impressionable men with aptitudes for certain uh, behaviors, <laughs> proclivities, and uh, pulling them in to their, uh, to their ends and their sort of inner, so their, their secret society of round table groups and circles within circles type uh, structure. Uh, so it's curious to see that it, the, the Chatham House has a link with Balliol College, Oxford. Uh, 
Then Toynbee's back tells us that many eminent historians served on the FPRS as, uh, under Arnold Toynbee. This is the Foreign Press and Research Service, in case you're wondering what FPRS means. And uh, so that's Toynbee and Lionel Curtis. So not only is Toynbee funded by the Rockefellers writing history books, but he's also um, the director of many eminent historians. Uh, and then, the, so it doesn't give us a list, but if, if Toynbee is being paid by the Rockefellers to write history books, and then he himself is overseeing the work of eminent historians, then you've got to be asking the question, how reliable are our history books? And you've got to be kind of exploring those networks uh, as they link to these kind of characters when you're buying books and choosing what to read and choosing what to believe and trust and where to learn from. Uh, give some thought to authors and writers who are actually connected with, with this whole network. And then we got this name, Alfred Zimmern. He, he, he uh, stood out to me as well. Uh, he was an English scholar, historian, political scientist, and a policymaker during World War I, prominent liberal thinker, and he played an important role in drafting the blueprint for what would become the League of Nations. And as we know, the League of Nations, forerunner to the United Nations, probably a likely candidate or forerunner to some sort of world government. So... Post-war years, while a number of staff returned to the Institute at the end of the war, a proportion of members found themselves joining a range of international organizations, surprise, surprise, including the UN, the United Nations, and the International Monetary Fund. So remember I mentioned before that the, uh, the policy area that they're interested in was finance up here, global economy and finance. And there it says down here that they ended up in the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. And I've got a few books on that that we might be able to read at some point. But for now, just to, good to know that, you know, these, these organizations, these institutions, they are overlapping. They have revolving doors at the top. People jump from one to the other and back again. And this is how you have this upper crust of uh, class of people on the top, you know, and everybody else underneath. And they're making decisions that affect all of us. And none of us elected them or voted for them or even know their names unless you're a nerd like me or, or, or like you watching and listening to this and you're looking at books and uh, scouring Wikipedia to try and uh, get a handle on some of these things, right? Um, so Chatham House found itself to be a leading actor in international political and economic redevelopment. In reaction to the changing post-war world, Chatham House embarked on a number of studies relating to Britain and the Commonwealth's new political stature in light of growing calls for decolonization and the development of the Cold War. Um, so decolonization, also something that we are seeing a lot of people wanting to pull down statues and uh, get rid of, rename streets and buildings and uh, erase the history and further muddy and, and mess with the past to even to make things even more complicated and confusing for those of us who are trying to figure out what the hell's going on. <laughs> And then I just highlighted this phrase. I thought it was odd. The development of the Cold War. Uh, the way I read that at first was like they were the ones developing it. <laughs> like they were developing the story or the narrative or the plan. You know, uh, I just thought it was an odd phrase uh, and maybe, maybe you know, quite revelatory. I don't know. Uh, but recent history... Uh, so this is January 2013, the Institute announced its Academy for Leadership in International Affairs, offering potential and established world leaders a 12-month fellowship at the institution with the aim of providing a unique program of activities and training to develop a new generation of leaders in international affairs. So they're training globalists, uh, and it sounds very much like the uh, WEF, the World Economic Forum's Young Global Leaders Initiative. Uh, you know, these kind of think tanks and these groups, they do similar kind of things, slightly different names, but Academy for Leadership and International Affairs, you know, young global leaders, same kind of thing. The Institute celebrated its centenary in 2020 with a series of events and initiatives. Uh, and this included three Chatham House Centenary Awards, one for David, Sir David Attenborough, one for Melina Abdullah and Greta Thunberg, the autistic teenager from Sweden gets a, a Chatham House Centenary Award. So she's doing her bit and she is uh, being a little, a good little puppet for the plans and machinations and schemes of the people 
who attend this uh, illustrious institution. And so uh, this is this was also very interesting. Recent reports. So this is 2015. Several reports were published by Chatham House, including Nigeria's booming borders, the drivers and consequences of unrecorded trade. So what does that say to you, that phrase, unrecorded trade? That says to me something like cash or or uh, barter. They don't want they want to get rid of that. You know, they don't want you using cash. They don't want you using barter. They want you using their currency. They want you to um, exchange in a way that they can track and they can see and they can have their slice of. And I've just got to go back up here for a second because we got Dave in the chat who says that Melina Abdullah is the founder of BLM. Is that right? It is right. Well played, Dave. Thank you very much. See, this is why it's good to have a community and a group of people. We all put our minds together. We all share the different puzzle pieces that we each have and it helps us all understand the picture. Wow, fantastic. I didn't even uh, look up, look that up. I just glossed over the name. But uh, so there you go. <laughs> Not surprising in the least bit, I have to say. Uh, yeah, so unrecorded trade to me, that sounds like, uh, okay, how do we make sure we track every single exchange and, and spending of money and um, make sure we, nobody's, you know, gather and collect all that data and control further what people can and cannot buy and have access to. So that's uh, that, fra that, that unrecorded trade phrase stood out to me. Then we got changing climate, changing diets, pathways to lower meat consumption. Now, uh, if you've been watching my videos for any amount of time, you will know I'm a massive fan of meat. Not, not because, um, you know, I like not because, not for any reason other than it's incredibly nutritious. It has changed my life in terms of my mental health, my energy levels, my focus, my ability to get things done and to function in the world. Um, it's incredibly good for the environment when it's produced properly. And it's incredibly healing. You know, all sorts of conditions can be healed by going onto an animal, uh, meat-heavy diet. And I'm not saying everything. It's not the be-all, end-all. It's not like everyone should only eat meat all the time. But a carnivore diet or a near-as-carnivore diet is what I'm on. It can be incredibly beneficial for lowering inflammation, for uh, helping uh, regulate uh, hormone levels, for the, uh, for helping regulate um, blood sugar, glucose, uh, and in the in the blood and and in the insulin response. Incredible power to heal uh, for, for certain conditions and, and for certain people. And they want to get rid of it. They want us eating less of that incredibly healing, nutrient-dense uh, food. But I'm sure they will still be eating it. And we'll be eating our, uh, you know, cockroach protein bars as seen in the film Snowpiercer. <laughs> uh, but this, this report that they did uh, examines a reduction in global meat consumption as critical to keeping global warming below the danger level. And I like how they've put that in inverted commas. <laughs> the danger level <laughs> of two degrees Celsius. Like It's like whoever wrote this even thinks it's bullshit. But uh, quite funny that. Uh, another report was America's international role under Donald Trump explores the impact of US President Trump's personality and style. Brash, unpredictable, contradictory, and thin-skinned on his engagement in foreign affairs. So that sounds completely uh, impartial and objective, doesn't it? as people tend to be when they talk about uh, Donald. Uh, okay, distinctions. Chatham House was named Prospect Magazine's Think Tank of the Year. <laughs> like, just gave me a chuckle that there's even award, an award for Think Tank of the Year. Uh, you know, how it, it's like, I don't know, it kind of strikes me as something comical and like it's worked out on the basis of like how much evil did you do? You know, uh, but yeah, think tank in the year. And then uh, quite interestingly here, we got the University of Pennsylvania's rankings for 2017. Chatham House was ranked think tank of the year and the second most influential in the world after the Brookings Institution and the world's most influential non-US think tank. All right. So if you're new to think tanks and their influence and their power and their control and their impact on the world that we live in, and the way the people around us think and behave and interact with us and the worldview they have and the worldview uh, that, that comes at us through our schooling, through our televisions, to, through our radios, then um, if you want to start a study, an investigation into think tanks, I reckon you should start with Chatham House, Royal Institute for International Affairs and the Brookings Institute because first and second most influential in the world. 
How about that? Uh, and it's had three pres or it has three presidents. One is Lord Darling. <laughs> what a name. <laughs> Lord Darling of R Rulanish. Uh, and this fellow was a um, chancellor of the Exchequer. And then we've also got Baroness Manningham Buller. She was a former director general of MI5. And Helen Clark, the former prime minister of New Zealand. So this is a this is a big club that you're not you and I are not in. In other words, uh, the funding didn't actually tell us m much that was very interesting. Uh, but in November 2022, the funding transparency website gave Chatham a C grade, which I guess is I guess A is the best, and they got a C. So they are not very transparent about who funds them, according to who funds you. And then a load of list of other linked and similar uh, think tanks here. So you know these are the these are more, these are more likely to be the source of power. You know these are the people you don't vote on. They're never in the news. They're not elected. You don't get to have any real visibility. You, well, you do get a visibility into who's in them and who are members. But they're not in the public eye in the same way like a, a Donald Trump is or a Rishi Sunak or a Keir Starmer. You know, that that whole political thing that's on your TV and in the news, that is the puppet show theater uh, sort of performative fake version of, of the control system. If you actually want to know about the real control system, then you would be better off looking in these kinds of places, I think. And so uh, a little quick look at, at Chatham House's uh, own website. Uh, and I didn't spend too long on here, uh, but, and you can see that, uh, that oh, that's IMF meetings. Yeah. But I did go to, uh, we got the about us page. Um, we got the Chatham house rule. So that's a very famous thing actually. So they've got a little page on that. Our governance, I think is what I was looking at. Uh, yeah. So we got president Mark Carney. He's an ESG and impact fund investing uh, guru, I suppose. So ESG is environmental social governments. This is the uh, communitarianism, communism slash socialism type of system that they want to roll out where you can't do anything unless it benefits everybody else according to their, their metrics and definitions. And then impact fund investing. This is a phrase that has come up before very much in connection with the Rockefeller Foundation. And uh, the, I'll have a shout out here to the Alan Watt CTTM uh, book group on Telegram. Uh, Andrea and Darren, who run that group, along with uh, Alan's wife, Melissa, are incredible researchers. And, and they have, an, like, they put this resources and links nonstop it's incredible what you can go there and learn. I could spend all day in that one group alone <laughs> and, and just have my mind blown. But I asked Andrea about this term impact investing and it's very much linked with the Rockefellers. They have a bunch of stuff on their website. They're partnering with data.org. So it's very much linked with gather technocracy in, in the sense of gathering, tracking, tracing, data, basing all this information uh, and then, you know, calculating who gets to have the money. Uh, and for what and what's going to have the most impact. So ESG and impact fund investing is not a good thing for the average uh, Joe and Jane. Uh, and Mark Carney is the president of Chatham House and he's an expert in it. He's also an economist and a banker. He was the governor of the Bank of England Central Bank for uh, seven years. And before that, the Bank of Canada Central Bank for five years. Uh, he was also the chairman of the Financial Stability Board. He worked at Goldman Sachs and the Canadian Department of Finance. So... Just a just an average guy like me and you. <laughs> I'm sure he's got our best interests in heart. Uh, so let me have a little. What else did I want to show you on here? Uh, oh yeah, John Major. So that's an ex UK. I was going to say president, but uh, it's not a president; it's a prime minister. And then we've got a little more about us, our funding. Chatham House is a registered charity in England and Wales. It's a charity. Just charitable people and non-profit organization with a financial visibility rating of C. <laughs> and it's and it's been granted 501c3, which is equivalent 
equivalently equivalent equivalency status with the US Internal Revenue Service. So it's a uh, you know it's exempt it's tax exempt in other words. Uh, ooh. And I think we also I also wanted to have a quick look on our is it our history? No, we just read about history, so we don't need to read that again. Our mission and values. This was it. So our mission. We want to build a sustainably secure, so sustainably secure, prosperous and just world. Uh, so it's sustainably secure. I, I mean, this is a weird thing to say. It's sustainably secure, but sustainably to me now means once it's established, it ain't going away. It is permanent. It is sustainable. It is a. Uh, going to be impossible to for it for the system to be overturned once it's locked in when it's when we're all chipped or tagged or you know carrying around devices that spy on us all day long every day uh, and and become our whole lives and have our identity and our payment methods and our id documents and in them it's it's we're going to be locked into it and it's going to be extremely uh, hard to get out of it so that's what i read when i see sustainably secure i think for them the rest of us are going to be locked into this digital hell system and they're going to be very secure from us ever, you know, rising up and, uh, you know, fighting back at prosperous again for who, who's, who, who is going to enjoy the prosperity, uh, and just, well, I don't think, uh, that means what we might think it means, but they are, they're all about empowering the next generation to build a better world. So I kind of feel like it's, um, to do with this, you know, training the leaders and training the ruling class and the next generation who are going to take over when this current generation get too old to do that. And they have this thing called the second century goals. So they're a hundred years old and these are their goals for their second century. But I kind of read second century, you know, it has connotations of like resetting time, like we're in a new era and this is the second century. You know, in any other context, you say the second century and it means, uh, you know, the year 200 AD. And, or no, it's probably like 100 to 200 AD. Um, but Chatham House have got their own second century goals. And again, it's sustainable and sustainable and equitable. And so I had a quick look up for this word equitable and the etymology of it. Uh, the quality of being equal uh, or impartiality, the, qu the quality of being impartial. Uniform relation to, of one thing to others. Conformity. So I think that's probably a safe bet for what they mean when they talk about equitable. Everyone has the same. Nobody is uh, wealthier than anyone else. You all have the same amount. It's equitable. You have the same access to the same number of calories from the same source, the same amount of freedom, which is very little. Uh, that's kind of the way I read it because that's the way it looks. That's the way the system seems to be designed to achieve peaceful and thriving societies. Promote the rule of law over the rule of force. But who writes the laws and, and based on what authority? You know, that's a question you've got to be asking. Accountable and inclusive governance. Inclusive. So, yeah, we've got to include everybody, no matter what, uh, you know, how whether they're perverted or degenerate or, or psychopathic or uh, they have mental disorders or whatever. They have to be included and represented. Otherwise, it's not fair. And then, of course, this is all going to be done by technological innovation. Uh, our values, so independence. So presumably that means they themselves, the members of this uh, organization are independent and they're not interfered with. They don't have to, you know, bow down to, uh, you know, these petty government rules that the rest of us have to live under. You know, they're independent of all that. Uh, they're inclusive and diverse, uh, you know, again, buzzwords and collaboration. Uh, but with who and to what ends, because uh, certainly we're not being asked about uh, who we want to, you know, what problems we want them to work on or uh, who we want to elect to be the president of uh, Chatham House or Royal Institute of International Relations. So I have a feeling we're being left out of all this, even though these words sound good. I might give you a warm feeling on the inside. I don't think they're talking about us. Uh, but there is a whole long list of the people who are involved here. So that would be a, also another good place, I think, fruitful. There's a lot of uh, doctor, there's a baroness, uh, I did notice, yeah, doctor, we've got OBE, so Knights of the um, British Empire. We've got a doctor again, professor. So, you know, it's the upper crust elite type characters. And there was a page I was looking at before as well, and there was, uh, there was quite a lot of, um, how do you call them, you know, uh, lords. 
sort of, uh, I don't like to say elite, I like to say parasite class. But you know where I'm coming at. But there's a lot of names here anyway, so I'm sure that would be incredibly fertile ground to uh, to dig into if anyone was so inclined. Uh, okay, the other thing we got uh, to briefly look at right now is uh, this is the Rockefeller Foundation. So we're bringing it around now to get into the book reading. Uh, this is the current president uh, was appointed the you said administrator by President Obama. Uh, and that is high impact, so impact investing, as we just saw, you know, with the Royal Institute of International Affairs, Chatham House page. That's impact, high impact investing, public-private partnerships, which are not good for anybody because that means the public takes all the risk and pays the bills and, and uh, has to give up and do the work, basically, and the private interests rake in all the profit and the benefits. That is how a public-private partnership works. Uh, this gent, who is now the president of the Rockefeller Foundation, previously served at the Bill and Melinda Foundation. So, surprise. And he's also received several honorary degrees. <laughs> and we were looking that up uh, in, in a previous uh, intro to one of the uh, readings, how a lot of these characters, they just get given degrees for no reason. They don't have to study. They just get automatically promoted from a bachelor to a master's. Just an honorary degree. Because, you know, you're so wonderful and brilliant and you're the president. And, uh, you know, and just as a side note, it's no accident that the president of a corporation and the president of a country have the same job title. It's because both of those things are corporations and they are run as corporations. And what is the only uh, edict of a corporation in the eyes of the law? Well, it's to make money for the shareholders and the board members. Uh, and the, cor the word corporation itself, you know, comes from corp meaning corpse, and oration, meaning voice. So it's a dead voice, just as a side note there. And so a couple of uh, tabs on solutions. I think I mentioned this last week, but it's worth mentioning again. Uh, this film, uh, Big Picture, which uh, I've, I hadn't heard about before, but Parallel Mike put me onto this. And this is a conversation between David Rogers Webb, who authored the book, The Great Taking, and G. Edward Griffin, who authored the book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. Two incredible must read books if you want to understand finances in the modern world and how the system is really stacked against us and used to exploit and enslave two of the like the, the finest people in the moment having a conversation. Uh, and so that's very much worth watching and it is free. You just click play and uh, watch that. And then what I also like about this website, Big Picture, is they have other films and projects that you can fund. If you choose, so they they've got one in the they've got one in the bank here. They want to do a CBDC documentary called The End of Money. Uh, so it's going to be forty five minutes. They've got a target of eighty five thousand, and they've got seventy six thousand in the bank towards that. Fantastic. So how about that one? I probably can't even read that out because it will <laughs> ping me and get the channel immediately uh, shut down. But they're working on important stuff. What happened at school? Um, yeah, so this is, this is one that I would love to see because I often talk about how school children were targeted and the, some of the main victims of the events of the last three years, the, the great scam and people don't talk about it enough and, and adults, you know, the adults are too chicken or embarrassed or ashamed or soft or whatever the word is to step in and go, do you know what happened to children over those, over the last well, three years? four years, um, it was, it was horrific and it was evil and it was cruel. And, you know, I don't have children, but most of us stood by and let it happen. And it's, uh, it's a, an extreme embarrassment and a stain on our collective conscience and, and history as far as I'm concerned. So that would be an incredibly good documentary to get out into the world. So there you are. You can uh, throw a bit of money at these gents or, or women. I don't even know if they're gentlemen or women, but help them make important documentaries that change minds because not everyone has the patience, the appetite, the energy, and the attention to read a book or to listen to me talk about books and reading them. Uh, and so G. Edward Griffin, he has an event called the Red Pill Expo, which is happening this year, June the 15th and 16th, 2024, Rapid City, South Dakota. I am an affiliate for this. So if you are interested in registering to go in person or watch on the live stream, you can click the link in this description. And uh, I think you will learn a lot. Look at the speakers. We got David Webb, who I just mentioned, Mickey Willis. He did uh, the pandemic 
documentaries, one, two, and three. Andrew Kaufman, uh, Terrain Theory of Disease Advocate, and uh, really great human. I like him and his work a lot. Uh, and these people, I don't know. But if these people are all appearing with uh, these people, they are probably have good stuff to, to say and uh, teach us. So that is another thing as well in terms of solutions is all about learning, educating, and then helping to get other people to learn these similar sorts of things. And I think that is it for the preamble ramble. And I've just closed everything. Uh, what I need to do is go here and then go to the head cam. That was a bit chaotic. When I closed all my tabs down, everything disappeared and, and it got mixed up. All right. So we are, we, we got to get into the book, but let's have a quick uh, scan of the uh, chat and I'll just have a sip. Katie says, I can't stay for the live as I'm going out, but it's proving a fascinating book, really enlightening. Awesome. Hello, Katie. Uh, this is a hello to you watching it on the replay later. I hope you're enjoying it and you had a good evening. Uh, cool. We got some stuff about seven. LJ is having problems loading, but hopefully it's sorted now. Shasti, Shasti says, would you date a clownfish person that was of the same biological sex of your preference? Uh <laughs> Is that a question to me or everyone in the chat? Let's let's see if anyone else has answered this. Firstly, I'm married, so uh, no, because I only date my wife. CSP says it sounds very communism. And Heidi says, I'll be alone in a ditch when that kicks in. <laughs> Surrounded by flowers, probably, knowing you. Or next to CSP, yeah. Uh, Dave says his cousin has a boyfriend that is very clearly female. Oh, on the topic of this, um, we, my wife and I started watching a series called Bodies. It's on Netflix. No, no, no. Sorry. We have started watching that. But that's not what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is a series called um, Ripley. And this series is about uh, the character, the talented Mr. Ripley. It's a remake of, of that film, only turned into a series. And it's a mini series, got eight episodes. And um, there's a character in there. And this character's name is, I'm just looking, Freddie Miles. Right? Freddie Miles. And the character is a man. Uh, but the character is not played by a man. The character is played by Elliot Sumner. Uh, have you heard of Elliot Sumner? Well, if you haven't, you have now. Sumner is the child of musician Sting and actress Trudy Styler. They began their music career at a young age and signed a record deal with Island Records at 17. Sumner released a debut album in 2010. They have acted in films. So this Sumner is what confuses you. You know, it's the whole pronoun game, isn't it? Uh, they, they. So they, they, they. They, there it is, they. Uh, and what was interesting to me, the reason I looked this person up was because in the seer, in the um, in the show, uh, which it says here is this show Ripley, in the show, this actor, actress, came round to meet the other characters, and um, everyone in the whole show referred to this actor's character as a he. And no one ever mentioned the fact at any point that it was obviously a woman. And so uh, nobody even raised an eyelid. Nobody looked at someone else when they said he. No, they just, everyone just psychically and automatically knew uh, that, that this character was a man and to refer to the character as a man. And that is uh, just a kind of bit of a pre-programming, a bit of a telling you how you should be done. You should just know. Don't ask any questions. You should just know intuitively uh, whether, you know, what pronoun to use. And, and so I, I just thought it was a bit of a, a bit on, on the nose, uh, and, um, strange really, because, you know, in real life, it'd be as soon as the character left, they'd be like, you know, there'd be some sort of <laughs> admission or acknowledgement, but it's that it's about normalizing this, isn't it? I think so. Uh, good luck to your cousin, Dave. I hope that all pans out well. And, and, uh, uh, for everybody involved. 
uh, okay, we got a little talk about hyperinflation, wheelbarrows full of money, and it did happen in Greece. And uh, people saying the channel's good. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Heidi says meat heels. Yep. Hasdak says Zimmern was German Jewish and Huguenot. I'm not sure what that word means. Um, Dave says WHO definition of sustainable is not compromising things for future generations. So secure forever. Yeah. You know, like uh, th their, their main way of not compromising things for the future generations is to not have future generations, I think. <laughs> Solves the problem right there, doesn't it? There's not going to be any future generations to worry about. So, um, Rosemary says, I've been telling people to watch Black Mirror. I only watched two. It made me feel sick. Yeah. Yeah. I was, yeah. Black Mirror is dark, very dark, very heavy, um, bleak. There's a few episodes that are uplifting and really good to watch. One is Hang the DJ. Uh, I actually recommend that. And I think that's a good one. I, I think that's, that's quite uplifting and feel good. Um, uh, but most of them are just, dystopic dystopic nightmares and uh and leave you really gloomy but they're incredibly well made and they're cr incredibly like revelatory about you know where things are going and what's what's coming down the pike i think um cool and rosemary says the man who made wikipedia and sold it said he was shocked about how they're changing information i didn't know that that is quite an interesting tidbit all right let's get into the book um because that's what we're here for, isn't it? And it's taking me longer and longer to get to the actual reading. So apologies. Uh, yeah. We got the Rockefeller Foundation. And we are tonight continuing with chapter 19, which is the humanistic studies. So let me just get comfortable and I'll get this up. And we'll make it visible. Hopefully that's clear. Lighting good. Okay, so yeah, I think six chapters left, two tonight, two on Thursday, two on Saturday. And then what's next? We shall see. Uh, all right. So humanistic studies, chapter 19. The world has proved over and over again that men do not live by bread alone. Even if the social sciences were adequately developed and a substantial measure of rational control were introduced into the complex mechanism of the 20th century, the total result, without the contributions to cultural development which the humanities must make, would still be distorted and incomplete. There is a hunger in the world which economists and political scientists cannot really relieve. As they have in all ages, men turn today for their ultimate satisfactions to humanism. To the philosophers, the teachers, the historians, the artists, the poets, and the novelists, the dramatists. All those who fashion ideas, concepts, and forms that give meaning and value to life and furnish the patterns of conduct. It is they who really construct the world we live in. And it is they who, with sensitive awareness of human perplexity and aspirations, can speak effectively to a distracted age. Every creative contribution of the physical and social sciences to the problems of society is to be welcomed. But to expect those sciences to meet the spiritual hunger for hope and belief and beauty and permanent values is a form of superstition as withering as any which humanity has thus far outlived. Insofar as this principle has been reflected in the work of the Rockefeller Foundation, it is a development only of the last two decades. In 1913, when the foundation was being organized, Jerome D. Green, the executive director, listed the fine arts as among the fields which could profitably be entered. As we have seen, however, public health and medicine dominated the early years of the foundation, and except for a single grant to the American Academy in Rome, which Green later described as staking a claim for the fine arts, more than a decade and a half elapsed before the foundation became formally identified with any work in this general area. In the meanwhile, the General Education Board in 1924 began a series of tentative grants to encourage the development of the humanities in the universities. The aim of this new program, as stated by the officers, was to preserve the proper balance of our educational activities and Abraham Flexner the secretary of the General Education Board, was the driving force behind it. 
The initiation of this development was in part due to a dramatic speech which Edwin R. Embry, director of the Division of Studies of the Foundation, had made a year earlier at a joint meeting of the trustees of the Foundation and the General Education Board. And uh, it says in the footnote, Mr. Embry later became president of the Rosenwald Foundation. He warned that medicine and public health are not, quote, the only fields in which such organizations, foundations, could do notable work. In fact, may there not be some danger that the promotion of these subjects by so many rich and influential organizations may tend to throw out of proportion general consideration of the whole range of human affairs. In this country, it being known that funds can often be matched with a contribution from these foundations towards medicine, a belief is reported to exist that in certain instances, university presidents are deflecting to medicine and hygiene outside funds which might otherwise go to other departments. Of what good is it to keep people alive and healthy if their lives are not to be touched increasingly with something of beauty? That's a good question. The first appropriation of the General Education Board in the field of the humanities was a seven-year grant totaling $780,000 to the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago to train the archaeologists needed for its large and expanding program. Training was also stressed in the gift of half a million dollars to Harvard for the Fogg Art Museum, a laboratory for students in the fine arts. Gradually, this program, under Flexner's direction, began to concern itself with the humanities at the university and post-university level. Grants whose total exceeded $2.25 million were given to the University of Virginia, Vanderbilt, Princeton, Chicago, Yale, Columbia, Harvard and Michigan for endowment of work in the humanities or for fluid research funds on a term basis. An appropriation was also made to the American Council of Learned Societies, a federation of organizations devoted to humanistic studies and a pattern of support was developed which was to be faithfully followed by the foundation in later years. The International Education Board, of which Flexner was the Director of Educational Studies, soon joined its sister organization in entering the humanistic field. The Charter of the General Education Board, as we have seen, limited it, its activities to the United States and the International Board stepped into the breach to carry the activities overseas. Among its grants were a million dollars to the American Academy at Rome, half a million to the American School of Classical Studies in Athens and over eight millions to the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago, largely in connection with its archaeological work in Egypt and the Near East. In reviewing the history of this early work in the humanities, before the Rockefeller Foundation came into the picture, one gathers the impression that it was coloured by traditional concepts centering largely in archaeological excavations, in scholarly research in ancient cultures, and in research centres in America for classical humanistic studies. Even at the time, this type of activity did not escape the criticism of some of the trustees. Thus, Anson Phelps Stokes, in 1927, wrote to Flexner, quote, The emphasis throughout your memorandum seems to me mainly on ancient history, ancient languages, and archaeology. And he protested that the word humanities should be more broadly interpreted. Years later, David H. Stevens, director of the Foundation's Division of the Humanities from 1932 to 1950, made a trenchant comment on this early period. Quote, how was this program a credit to us? In having a sense of magnitude, in what way a discredit? By buttressing scholasticism and antiquarianism in our universities. Two. I mean, well, just as a just as a comment there, scholasticism, I'm not quite sure what he's referring to and why that's a problem. But uh, antiquarianism, uh, I could see why he would think this is a problem. Because, uh, you know, we got to get rid of the old fuddy-duddy ways of the past and we got to bring in the new, right? We've got to have progress, scientific progress. Part two. When the Rockefeller Foundation, in the reorganization of 1928, took over the humanistic studies from the General Education Board and the International Education Board, it created a division of the humanities of which Professor Edward Capps was the first director. 
By training and tradition, he was a classicist, and in the brief period in which he held the post, the programme continued largely along the lines laid down by the other boards, centering to a great extent in archaeological interest, although branching out into some significant work in bibliography. At his retirement, no director was immediately appointed, and the resignation of one of the trustees, Mr. Stokes, who had frequently insisted before the board that science is not dangerous if the humanities are also cultivated, was prompted, in part at least, by his disapproval of the delay. In 1932, Stevens, who had been Professor of English at the University of Chicago and Vice President of the General Education Board, was elected to the vacant position and a new emphasis in the programme began to assert itself. The agenda for a trustees' meeting in the spring of 1933 put the matter this way. Quote, the past 20 years have seen a continuous rise in the material valuations of life which should make possible and indeed demand a corresponding rise in its spiritual and cultural values. The humanities should contribute to a spiritual renaissance by stimulating creative expression in art, literature and music, by setting and maintaining high standards of critical appreciation and by bringing the intellectual and spiritual satisfactions of life within the reach of greater numbers. Beyond such benefits to the individual, the humanities should exert national and international influence for a reduction of racial prejudice. Ignorance of the cultural background of another people is at the root of many understandings that are as harmful internationally as political and economic differences. That ignorance can be steadily lessened by an interchange of cultural values, by discovery of common origins for diversified national ideas and ideals, and by the interpretation of one cultural group to another. So that sounds a lot like globalism. That sounds like homogenizing the world's cultures and people. This shift of emphasis from traditional humanistic research, a shift to interpretation rather than preservation, so they're not bothered about preserving it anymore, was a graduated process. And it was not until the mid-30s that it began radically to affect the expenditures of the foundation. During this interim period, the greater part of the appropriations went for fluid research funds in a selected group of universities, as well as in the American Council of Learned Societies. Through these funds, over 200 humanistic scholars received direct assistance. It was a fortunate time for historians, linguists, and editors of texts and manuscripts. Many older men, who had been handicapped by lack of funds for work abroad, completed their lifelong studies of particular themes and undoubtedly inspired their students to, produ to productive activity in their special fields. Several cooperative projects of large scale were formulated and put into action. Support was given to such enterprises as the Dictionary of American Biography, largely financed from other sources the Dictionary of American English, critical texts of Spencer and Short Chaucer, and archaeological expeditions in Egypt, Greece, and Syria. The Dictionary of American Biography, a monolith of American scholarship, was completed by scores of workers inside and outside the universities, and field work for the linguistic atlas of New York, England brought together large stocks of unique data. The aristocratic tradition of humanistic scholarship to which we have referred undoubtedly had its values. The manipulation of the substances of literary and linguistic history vitalized graduate studies and brought new interests to the fore. It stimulated pioneer work in many directions. Few will question, for example, what Breasted's work in Egypt had, has done in making humane for us a culture that we only dimly knew. Or what results would flow if we could break through the system of communication locked in the Mayan glyphs. But basically, this was not the kind of program which the trustees of the foundation supported with unquestioning enthusiasm. Jerome D. Green, now one of the trustees and deeply interested in the humanistic studies, felt that the humanities were suffering from what might be called the snobbishness of the classical tradition. So much of the work seemed oblivious of the present, it was based on the idea that what was in the past humane remained so today. A report of a special committee of the trustees in 1934 asked this question. Quote, 
What does all this activity accomplish in stimulating aesthetic appreciation, except in a limited number of highly specialized students? It frankly appears to your committee that a program in the humanities based on a cloistered kind of research is wide of the goal which the foundation should have in mind. It is getting us facts, but not necessarily followers. We have more detailed information about a great number of rather abstruse subjects, but that does not logically mean that the level of artistic and aesthetic appreciation in America has been measurably raised. This same note was struck by the president of the foundation, the present writer, in his annual review a year or two later. Quote, From being aristocratic and exclusive, culture is becoming democratic and inclusive. The conquest of illiteracy, the development of school facilities. Oh, well, there's that, uh, <laughs> there's that foreshadowing of the inclusivity that we're all having uh, rammed down our throats in the present day. Uh, the conquest of illiteracy the development of school facilities, the rise of public libraries and museums, the flood of books, the invention of the radio and the moving picture, the surge of new ideas, and above all, perhaps, the extension of leisure, once the privilege of the few, are giving culture in our age a broader base than earlier generations have known. New interests are in the making, an adventurous reaching out for a fuller life by thousands to whom non-utilitarian values have hitherto been inaccessible. Any program in the humanities must inevitably take account of this new renaissance of the human spirit. In 1935, therefore, the trustees decided, in addition to maintaining certain older interests, to strike out experimentally in new fields, and in a formal resolution, they authorized the officers to develop projects in the general area of libraries and museums, drama, radio, and moving pictures. The collection and interpretation of native cultural materials and the improvement of international communication through the development of language teaching, particularly with relation to Latin America and the Far East. This emphasis on the relevancy of humanistic study to contemporary life is one which has been maintained for the last decade and a half. Experience has modified the items in the original programme, and the diversification has frequently been shifted and altered to meet the unforeseen exigencies of the fourth decade. But the redirection of foundation support from traditional humanistic research towards activities which would conceivably bring the values of the humanities more directly into contact with daily living has been the constant policy of the decision. Sorry, of the division. Three. The interest of the foundation in libraries and library techniques stemmed from the older program in the humanities. Back in the 20s, the International Education Board made an appropriation of £250,000 for the building and endowment of a new library at Cambridge University in England, located on a site already purchased by the university. At Oxford, the Bodleian Library, founded in 1598, is not only the university's central library, but a national repository, containing a comprehensive record of three centuries of British life. Under the Copyright Act, it receives, as Cambridge does, a copy of every book printed in the United Kingdom. The scope and scholastic values of its collections, attracting scholars from all over the world, have made Oxford a leading centre in humanistic research. The university's problem at the end of the 20s was how to preserve the traditional and historic value of the Bodleian at the same time and at the same time maintain Oxford's prestige as a home of living research by keeping it abreast in modern library requirements. In 1929, at the invitation of the Foundation, a commission from the University, in an attempt to find a solution, visited libraries in Rome, Paris, Geneva and other continental centres and in 16 American and Canadian cities. As a result of the study, a plan was outlined providing for the continuance of the historic Bodleian, mainly as an enlarged range of reading rooms and for the erection of a new building adequate for the housing of five million volumes. For this purpose, the foundation made a grant of $2.3 million and the new facilities, long delayed by the war, were formally opened by King George VI in 1946. Concurrently with this development, the foundation gave assistance to the National Central Library in London, 
which had been established to supplement the library facilities of the provincial universities and act as a clearinghouse for the distribution of books to individuals and schools. Aid was also given in the establishment of a library training centre in London. Out of the earlier humanities programme too came the Foundation's interest in developing adequate tools for library research, an interest which continued through the 30s. An appropriation was made, for example, to place the complete card catalogues of the Library of Congress relating to nearly 2 million books in the 50 leading libraries of the world. By a photographic process, these cards were reduced to 167 volumes, 18 cards to a page, and it was these sets that were presented to libraries ranging all the way from Australia, Tokyo and Calcutta to Oxford, Edinburgh and the Vatican. And a footnote here, in naming five American librarians who had carried the load of detail of this vast enterprise, the preface to Volume 1 made this acknowledgement. They have done far more for the enduring life of their country than many whose first names and photographs are familiar around every wood-burning stove in the United States. Grants were also made for three extensive cataloguing projects in Europe, the Catalogue of Printed Books in the British Museum, the General Catalogue of the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, and the Union Catalogue of the Prussian State Library in Berlin which embraced not only its own collections, but also those in the 10 Prussian university libraries, in the State Library of Bavaria, and in the National Library of Vienna. Support was given, too, to the Library of Congress in a number of exploratory fields where, because techniques were untried and results were uncertain, public funds could not readily be obtained to blaze the trail. Thus, Grants were made to enable the library to gather source material in American history by obtaining photographic copies of materials in libraries abroad. Another grant was for the purchase of equipment for the collection of American folk- folklore at a time when the library was beginning to work in that field. Grants were also made towards the development of a catalogue and the organisation of bibliographical services for the Hispanic and Slavic materials in the library. Finally, the foundation contributed towards the expenses of equipping and operating for an initial period a laboratory of microphotography to enable the library to make its materials easily available in that efficient and economical form. In this movement to adapt microphotography to library use, the foundation was deeply interested. The advantages of microfilm are obvious. Reduction of storage space, preservation of fragile materials, simplification of interlibrary loans, and the development of collections of facsimile copies of rare documents at small expense. Over a 12-year period, the Foundation assisted 38 microfilm projects in 21 libraries and other institutions, both in the United States and abroad. Early in the Second World War, with widespread bombing on the increase, Rapid work was necessary in England to protect from complete loss the records of civilization that existed only in unique books and manuscripts. With foundation aid, microfilms of these treasures were produced as fast as possible and were stored in duplicate both in Britain and in the United States. Plans and photographs of historic British buildings were also made so that, in case of destruction, a record would remain and with it the possibility of rebuilding. Fellowships in library administration also constituted a significant part of the program. These fellowships were administered on an international scale and the plan embraced 19 countries, not only in Europe but in Latin America and the Far East. The purpose of the appointments, 48 in number, was to give to younger librarians marked for early promotion to key positions in libraries important to international service, training in methods, bibliography and a book purchasing in countries other than the, and book purchasing in countries other than their own so so this uh, this one's really about libraries and the question being who decides which books go in the libraries and, and which books are worth preserving and uh, should be kept and then they're also training up and grooming the uh, future librarians that they're going to send out all over the world. So uh, it, their, their reach, their tentacles, it, it is so absolute and complete. It goes into literally everything. It's wild. 
The Foundation's work in the field of museums was largely limited to experiments in training personnel and in testing methods of display. At a number of museums in the United States, groups of interns were appointed, each chosen for his knowledge of some particular phase of museum practice, such as classifying, lighting, display arrangement, or the preparation of catalogues. At the end of their service, these interns either went on to other museums, which wished to benefit by their knowledge, or returned to the museums from which they had been recruited, some of them in other countries. In a few other cases, grants were made to particular museums like the New York Museum of Science and Industry and the Museum of Modern Art for experimentations with new and original methods of display and educational presentation. As in the work with libraries, the fellowship device was widely used both to train younger people and to keep museum personnel in contact with new methods and ideas in other centres. 4. Foreign scholars in the humanities, as well as scholars in the United States, occasionally show some impatience with what they think is the overemphasis of American students on the tools of research. In our preoccupation with the gadgets of indexes and dictionaries and good library methods, we have little time for the task of interpretation and valuation, which is the basic function of humanism. In our interest in the technology, we miss the content. This criticism is perhaps not completely fair. The development of adequate tools and methods is important. Without them, scholarship would be thwarted and handicapped. And where is the line that can be sharply drawn between technology and content? Nevertheless, there is enough truth in the criticism to suggest the necessity of a better perspective. Humanistic study needs imagination, creativeness, and a clear objective as much as it needs microfilming machines and photostat copies. It needs two as we have indicated before, an ability to communicate with the general public to make the values which it represents an integral part of the life of people. As Howard Mumford Jones said, unless learning is socially relevant, learning is and remains antiquarianism. This was the reasoning behind the decision of the Foundation to move tentatively into the fields of radio and motion pictures. Here were active mediums of communication that were shaping and moulding the social ideas and aesthetic standards of people. Could a constructive contribution be made in this area by finding out, for example, what the public wanted and whether its wants could be met? It must be admitted that the trustees of the foundation took this step with some misgiving. The problem was extremely complex, and the hope of any substantial degree of success seemed dim. However, as an exploratory operation, a beginning was made. In radio, a series of grants was given to the Worldwide Broadcasting Foundation, which operated a shortwave station in Boston. The idea was to make possible experimentation with the production of educational programs on a financial basis, which would ensure superior quality without need of commercial subsidy. Through the use of other languages than English, the programs of this station helped to bring the United States into cultural contact with people in many countries, and as an example of the maintenance of high standards, it has undoubtedly served a useful purpose. During the war, its facilities were widely used by the government and are employed today in helping to broadcast the Voice of America. Another experiment was a cooperative undertaking in Chicago involving three universities and four local stations. After five years, the project, which had done some significant work in educational broadcasting, had to be abandoned. But a residue remained in the programs of the Chicago Round Table, which supports weekly discussions of ideas and events. Still another experiment along regional lines laid the groundwork of the Rocky Mountain Radio Council embracing the states of Colorado and Wyoming. The programs of this council have now become a regular service to the 44 educational and public organizations which constitute its membership, to most of the 37 radio stations operating in the two states, as well as, the, as to the people of the region. Along somewhat similar lines, the Foundation gave aid to the Library of Congress for a program of popular education, in the belief that the library had unusual facilities both in material and personnel for interpreting American life and tradition. These facilities, which the commercial companies lacked, 
included 20,000 recordings in its archives of American folk song, source materials in its division of manuscripts, and reports of the Federal Writers Project, which covered local and regional folk folklore and history. Programs were given on a wide variety of subjects, and some interesting pioneer work was done in previously unexplored techniques. It became evident, however, that during the war years, public money could not easily be obtained for such a project, and when the experimental period of the Foundation's grant came to an end, the program was discontinued. So again, cutting you off from the past uh, and, and pushing you into, into the progress of the future, which is all planned. An undertaking of perhaps deeper promise was the support given to the School of Public and International Affairs of Princeton University towards a study of the role that radio plays in the lives of the listeners. Organised under Dr. Paul F. Lazarsfeld, it attempted to answer such questions as these. What individuals and social groups listen to the radio? How much do they listen and why? In what ways are they affected by their listening? The radio industry had, of course, been concerned with determining the size and distribution of its audience as prospective purchases for products advertised over the air. To learn what it could of the listener as an individual and as a member of society, the Princeton study, quite literally, began where the industry left off. This same type of study was later supported at Columbia University, also under Dr. Lazarsfeld. The research by the two institutions not only gave a detailed and accurate portrait of the American listening public, but also developed new methods of inquiry applicable to forecasting and testing the response of untried programs, and the reports which grew out of the studies have been widely used in the radio industry. Dr. Lazarsfeld's office was increasingly consulted as a source of expert and impartial advice, inasmuch as analysis of public opinion lies on the fringes of the humanities, with parts of it reaching into sociological problems, later support by the foundation for this type of work was transferred to the social sciences division. So this sounds like... Um, you know, audience research and gathering data and information for, you know, what do you call it? Public relations. Um, the beginnings of that, I should say. Because it started with radio and then kind of, well, well, we need to know who's listening and why and how often what, what they're listening for and so we can advertise to them. And now it's like you're carrying around a spy device that gathers everything about you from the way you walk to where on the screen your eyes are drawn to, to how long you look at a particular thing before you uh, swipe or switch onto the next thing or scroll. Uh, it's, it's staggering, really, the amount of data that's captured now. And it kind of started you know, here, like, oh, we need to know who's listening to the radio. Out of this interest in studies of radio broadcasting grew another project which had wide public implications. In 1940, the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs, with the help of the foundation, began to record and analyze shortwave broadcasts dealing with the war and beamed to America from Europe. At the same time, a similar station, located at Stanford University in California, began also with the assistance of the foundation, to monitor shortwave broadcasts from across the Pacific. Some of this broadcasting was news. Much of it was propaganda. The results of the analysis in both institutions were made available in the form of bulletins, which were sent to students of communication and international affairs. When the United States entered the war, the need became apparent for a full-scale governmental agency to monitor and analyse broadcasts from abroad. The Federal Communications Commission, therefore, established at Washington the Foreign Broadcasting Monitoring Service, with the Princeton director in charge and with four members of his staff as his assistants. Additional listening posts were created in Puerto Rico and on the West Coast, with facilities for immediate reporting to Washington by teletype and with a staff that was expanded from the original 10 or 15 to over 400. The initial federal budget for this essential purpose was $800,000, in contrast to the foundation's priming grant of something like $45,000, which had launched the Princeton and Stanford experiments in basic methods and trends. The activities of the foundation in the motion picture field were limited to half a dozen diversified experiments, 
One interesting project was the assistance given to the Museum of Modern Art in New York in establishing its now celebrated film library. The purpose of this library, organized in 1935, was to meet a growing demand for a comprehensive knowledge of all types of films. Its two main functions were to serve as a repository for films and printed materials important for understanding the development of motion pictures and to exhibit as well as circulate these films and data to other educational organisations. The result has been that the film library has become a world storehouse and one actively in use of materials with historical significance rel relative to the development of this form of mass communication. So not only are they uh, paying the guy who writes the history books, <laughs> but they're also deciding what books go in the libraries and they're also deciding which uh, motion pictures get stored in the uh, repository for films. <laughs> it's just like mind boggling. Another experiment, uh, experiment not quite so happy was the assistance given to the American Film Center, an organization that was attempting to enter the field of educational motion pictures. The unanswered question at the time was whether the demand for such films was sufficiently large to justify production. The motion picture industry is a costly business that lives on the returns of giving the public what it wants. In fact, the costs of production are such that the entire income of a foundation could be swallowed up by a relatively small production program. For there is as yet little assurance that what are thought to be better films would find a public demand that would bring returns. Obviously, therefore, it would be impossible for a foundation to embark on any large undertaking in this direction. The only course open would be the limited support at strategic points of influences or of agencies working towards a higher standard of films. The American Film Center could not surmount the hurdles of public taste, the box office, and the high cost of production, and after several years of effort, it was liquidated. Although the foundation financed a number of interesting studies in motion pictures, it must be admitted that its record in this field was one of only limited success. One lesson is clear, wrote Stevens in 1947. If grants of a size the foundation could contemplate are to have real effect, the outcome must be strategically directed towards the practices of the, board of the broadcasting and motion picture industries. And just a side note on that word broadcast uh, was a meme I think I saw on Instagram today. And it said if one, if, if you, if, if, if you're casting a spell on one person, it's called spell casting. And um, if you're casting a spell on a whole society of people, it's called broadcasting. And I thought it was, it was very interesting how we, we, we have magic spells, but then we also spell words and that we broadcast, uh, you know, the, the, we tell a vision and there's a vision broadcast through these uh, Black Mirror devices. The, the, just the language and the wording around it all is very interesting and um, quite uh, revealing. And who made up these words and who gave these things the labels that they did, you know, that's another avenue of, of uh, inquiry that I think would be fruitful. Only by changing their present practices, controlling as they do the facilities for communication, and commanding as they do the mass audiences, will a wider educational or cultural usefulness be achieved in film or radio. Perhaps a more substantial, although intangible, contribution in this general field of mass communication was made by the Foundation's Fellowship Programme. 24 fellowships in film studies and 75 in radio were granted during the decade when the foundation was following this interest. Many of the men and women trained in this way have gained prominence both in the commercial and non-commercial aspects of film and radio. And although it is impossible to measure their influence and effectiveness, it may well be that their contribution of ideas and leadership has resulted in an appreciable advancement in their fields. So they're training librarians, they're training people in film, and they're training people in radio. Not to mention doctors, which uh, where it was where this all started, wasn't it? Five. Nationalism cannot resist the force of powerful intellectual curiosities that carry individuals beyond all borders to common sources of knowledge. 
This generalized statement, which Stevens made to the trustees in 1933, was the starting point of the Foundation's interest in modern languages. In a world whose ties are increasingly interwoven and interrelated, it is not enough to have the barriers of language breached by only a handful of cloistered scholars. If cultural interests are to be given a wider currency, and if the imperative need of mutual understanding between races is to be met, something must be done to break down the insularity created by ignorance of other languages. This was the argument of the trustees eight years before Pearl Harbor. At the moment, they were thinking primarily of the Far East. America had never developed a school for the study of Oriental languages and cultures, although such schools had existed in Europe over many years. There was the School of Oriental and African Studies of the University of London, the École Nationale des Languages Orientales Vivantes in Paris, and the Enochids Institute of Oriental Languages in Leningrad. Similar schools existed in Prague, Warsaw, Rome, Leiden and other cities. These schools combined the practical teaching of Oriental languages to diplomats, businessmen and scholars with a high type of specialised study in the cultures themselves. In the early 30s in America, instruction in Far Eastern languages was limited to a few older professors teaching Japanese and Chinese. In 1933, through the instrumentality of the American Council of Learned Societies, the Foundation made an appropriation designed to strengthen the Library of Congress as a center for students of Japanese and Chinese languages. Beginning in 1934, with Foundation Aid, a series of summer institutes was inaugurated at Harvard, Columbia, California and Cornell for the quick induction of younger scholars into the languages and cultures of Japan, China and Russia. The movement began to spread and by 1941, 12 institutions had special courses in one or more of these three languages. As the work progressed, new techniques of language instruction were developed which were quite distinct from the traditional methods of college courses. For example, the Foundation financed an experiment at Yale in the teaching of Chinese, which demonstrated that an initial command of that language in writing and in speech could be gained in two nine-week full-time courses. Similar intensive courses were supported in other institutions, and when Pearl Harbor arrived with its insistent demand for knowledge of the Far East and its languages, there was a substantial basis on which to build. In the extraordinary development which followed, a development guided largely by the American Council for Learned Societies, the Foundation played an important role. Its grants paved the way for the material methods and personnel which constituted the nucleus of the United States Army Language Training Program. Funds were given for the production of translations, vocabularies, grammars, dictionaries, primers, bibliographies and glossaries of technical terms. Financial support was advanced to expedite courses not only in the Chinese, Japanese and Russian languages, but in Turkish, Arabic, Persian, Hindustani, Malayan, Burmese, Tibetan, Siamese, Pidgin English and various regional languages of Africa. The number of institutions where this type of special course was being given rose from 12 to 55. The demand was not for linguists of the scholarly research type, but rather for a large number of men with a ready conversational grasp of these strategic tongues. Quote, the practical services rendered by the Humanities Division during the war were of vital importance, wrote Stevens in a review of the period, Quote, and surprised many skeptics who had insisted on thinking of the humanities as a useless luxury. During this period, too, the Foundation supported the development in the Far East and among foreign-born groups in the USA of the system of basic English. This system, developed by C.K. Ogden and I.A. Richards at Cambridge University, is a form of English in which 850 words with certain additions for special purposes will, for many practical situations, do the work of the 20,000 words in common use. As one commentator put it, why should a foreigner be told to say that he has disembarked from the ship? Isn't it sufficient for him to say that he got off? <laughs> and why should he be told to say that he has recovered from the flu, or escaped the police, or ascended a stairway, or boarded a train, or obtained a job? Isn't it enough to say that he got over the first, got away from the second, got up the third, 
got on the fourth and simply got the fifth. That's a really good point, actually. It takes me back to my days as, as an English teacher and, uh, and how I was probably two years into my um, teaching career until somebody like told me and pointed out to me about these 850 common words and how they're the most useful things to start teaching like um, new students uh, and you get those and get those basics right and and you can go a long way it's kind of like the 80 20 rule it's a little bit like the you know the four chord song by axis of awesome and they just play these four chords on repeat and they can sing 30 or 40 different pop songs over these same four chords it's like that really um so yeah this is a really good point but it does take out a lot of the the sort of artistry and the creativity uh, and the uh, the aspects of language that make it fun to play with. But for the purposes of learning it in order to communicate and learning it quick, uh, that's a really good thing to focus on. Scores of books, among them the English Bible, have been put into simplified vocabulary of basic. But the foundation had no thought of supporting basic against other competing approaches. Simultaneously, it was giving aid to the very different work which Charles C. Fries was doing in the teaching of English at Michigan, as well as to Richard's work with the Harvard Commission on Language Teaching. It also helped to finance the University of Chicago study that sought to evaluate these and other methods of acquiring a second language. In all this activity, the aim of the foundation has been to assist in the exploration of the field, to try to find some feasible path through the barriers of unfamiliar languages which divide the world. As the work developed after the close of the war, stress was placed not only on languages, but on cultures, the history, the literature, the philosophy, the ideas of Oriental civilization. And the foundation made extensive grants for library development and staff appointments. Among the places aided were the University of Washington, the University of California, the Hoover Institute of Slavonic Studies at Stanford, Pomona College, the University of Chicago, Yale University, and the Library of Congress. The study of Slavic and Chinese cultures and institutions was especially emphasized. Similar grants were made abroad, notably in England, Holland, and Sweden. A balanced program of Indic studies was initiated at the University of Pennsylvania under favorable circumstances. The heavy concentration within the United States of all this activity was a byproduct of war and post-war conditions. Certainly, it was not based on any illusion that internationally acceptable interpretations of the world's cultures can be achieved by American workers alone. It can hardly be questioned that the language program of the Foundation has had a major influence on the character of academic work in this field. It has played a major role in creating the present interest in area studies and in more intensive language instruction. The men and women trained under foundation fellowships are now the leaders in many of the centers of Far Eastern research in the United States. And between 1943 and 1948, America moved into a forward position among Western countries in Oriental and Slavic studies. A new pattern has been established, a new awareness of other corridors that lead, like our own, into the vast amphitheater of blending cultures into which we have now come. Yeah, blending cultures together. It's like that, um, probably uh, it was like a GIF or another meme or something, and it had all the pictures of, uh, pictures. It had all the colors of um, the rainbow, different lines of paint with each color of the rainbow, and then, a, and then this little mixy thing came in and stirred and, and stirred and mixed them all up. And then at the end of it, you had this really nice, like brownie kind of, shit color <laughs> it's what happens when you blend everything together and you just uh you merge it all into one kind of uh you know blob uh so i'm going to review the uh comments and then we'll crack on with the next chapter let's have a look so that was the last bit i read i think was about black mirror wasn't it so uh the the the, the episode that's good is uh hang the dj um Frank had to dip out, but he's going to catch up on the replay. Take it easy, Frank. And I hope uh, when you're listening to this on the replay that uh, you're doing well. So the Huguenots were French Protestants, first Protestant pilgrims to American continent. Okay. Am I pronouncing it right? Huge knots. 
Heidi says, Carnegie Library is a blessing and a curse. Yeah. Rosemary says, how can we stop them? The MPs and others must know about it. So evil. I think the way, the answer to that is to live your life in a way that you are as, as the, the least, you're using their systems to the least amount that is possible for you. It's, it's about being being as free from and as independent of the, their systems as possible because you can't really fight it, but you can just sort of sidestep it and do what you can to be more independent, whether that is growing food, whether that is um, just finding other ways to barter with people or to exchange skills or things that you grow for things that they, or things that you do for things that, you know, it's about like building communities and finding other ways through that aren't dependent on these systems that they've been investing in and building and growing and spreading around the world. So that's in a nutshell, you know, that's, that's an answer. Uh, I could go into more detail on another video, perhaps talk a little bit more about uh, solutions. Dave says, the US must have translated so much of these images from old libraries with AI secretly long ago as lots of stuff in, lots of stuff in Europe remains untranslated. Oh, that is interesting. LJ says, just as you said, this family firm had tentacles and everything. Radio and film industry is mind boggling. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And Heidi says, we broadcast seed as well. I think that's in reference to... Uh, planting growing gardens and, and plants and flowers yeah and and gwen says that was its original proper literal sense was to broad cast the seeds you know to grow whatever it is that you're trying to grow which is uh that is very cool and i didn't know that either <laughs> and uh, gwen says a lot of words derive from agriculture and nature yeah and then lj asked the question does language really divide the world i'll tell you what i lived in uh South Korea, Thailand, Vietnam, and uh, I'd never learned the, the local language, and I got by just fine, and I had a really good time, and people were very kind to me, and uh, and uh, it, was, it was a wonderful experience. And I learned, you know, I learned, please, thank you, you know, I learned how to ask for, like, one beer or order some food, very basic survival level language really but you could still have fun and communicate with people draw pictures and act and mime and do all sorts of things like that and people loved it and th i had a really good time so i think it might be a lie that language divides the world <laughs> i do wonder though and this might be one for you to ponder and, and i'd be interested to hear your thoughts why in england uh, and i think in america too we're basically monolingual right we basically just have most of us. If we're if we're kind of born like I'm English and I'm, I'm born in England, and I, I grew up here, and I basically just speak English fluently, and nothing else. And I learned a little bit of this and that here and there, but nothing to any decent level of competence. Now you go to somewhere like Malaysia, and pretty much everyone there has at least two, if not three or four languages that they speak fluently. And you go to countries in Europe, and, and people speak speak two or three languages fluently. So. It's absolutely possible to raise a nation of people to speak, to be bilingual. My question is, why has that not been done in England or the United Kingdom? Maybe maybe it's been done a little bit in Wales because they have Welsh, but largely speaking in England, and, and I think I'm right in saying in America as well, unless your background is, you know, um, is has some sort of other language in it and your ancestry and your upbringing and you got it at home from your parents, how come some countries can successfully raise pretty much everyone to be bi and trilingual, but then uh, here, you know, in England, we just don't get it. And in American schools, you don't get it. Uh, it's curious. I don't know why that is. Immune to PR says blending language. Hmm. Well, well, oh, okay, okay. Dave's here with an answer. English is, is a dialect continuum and the accent variation is as large as gaps between languages. Yeah, the number of words in English equals several languages. We aren't necessarily deficient in England. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Because a lot of people say to me, um, you know, I want to learn English, or they did in the past when I was a teacher, I want to learn English. I want to I want to speak with an English accent. And I was like, well, which one? <laughs> Do you want to sound like a Scouser or a Geordie or a Brummie? 
or a Londoner or, you know, uh, which, which pick, pick an accent because, uh, yeah, that's a really good point, Dave. World of My Own says, it depends how many times you've been invaded. Yeah, fair comment. We've been invaded a few times though here in England, but still all we've got is English. But English is that kind of like blended language, isn't it? A lot of language probably are, languages probably are already blended. But I just wonder how it's obviously possible to raise people with multiple languages. And I kind of resent sometimes not having had that. I don't resent it, but I'm too lazy to learn one at this point. It seems to be harder now that I'm older. English became the language of diplomacy. Yeah. And, and business, I think. In, in a, I think that's, it's, it's kind of a language of business as well. Now it is. And Dave says, so long as one speaks English well, that is. So long as one speaks English well, that is. Right. <laughs> I'm obviously failing to speak English well because I totally misread that. <laughs> I thought you hadn't finished your sentence. All right, cool. Sip, and then we'll crack on with chapter 20, which is humanism as an interpreter. I'm not quite sure what that means. A lot of people say that they don't even recognize my accent now, that I sound American or Australian. Some people think I sound a bit Irish. So I don't know what I've got these days. But I think as long as you can understand the words that are coming out of my mouth, then that's all that matters. It doesn't matter what accent I've got. Okay, chapter 20. Let's see. This going to be in for it. This is Humanism as an Interpreter. So it's a strange title, and I'm not quite sure what to expect in this one, if I'm honest. And uh, yeah, it's got, we've got a fair bit to get through, so I better get started. Let's find out. Humanism as an Interpreter. The humanist is often pictured as a scholar preoccupied with the past, but for true humanism, there are no visible frontiers between past, present, and future. It is the timelessness of his materials which accounts for the humanist's concern with them. Indeed, to release men from the bondage of time is one of his major functions. Not the past alone, but its projection into the past, present and future is important. All right, that, that was kind of a confusing paragraph. Did anyone else get lost there? Or was it just because I'm a bit tired? It sounded a lot like uh, or Orwell's, if you, you know, he who controls a present controls the past and he who controls the past controls the future type thing. This, as we have seen, was the emphasis which the foundation in the early 30s began to put upon its work in the humanities. In these years before the war, the new ideas in progressive education were bringing to the fore such terms as participation and self-expression. The recognition given in modern schools to precepts like learning through doing and doing with a purpose brought fresh vigour to the humanities, for these are also the principles underlying creative work in the arts. If our schools and colleges today if in our schools and colleges today the humanities mean more to more people, including the scholars, it is due in part, at least, to the recognition of the value of individual participation and self expression in cultural activities. Another significant change in public appreciation of the humanities came about through apparent accident. It was a logical sequence to the economic depression and its relief measures. Art for the masses came within the plans of the American government for relief and communities which had previously had no opportunities to take part in creative outlets, whether handicraft, music or drama, began to feel a new stimulus. Although Europe had long had its national drama and music festivals reflecting year-round activities of native populations, before 1929, the United States had little encouragement towards such vital expression in the arts. It was in this atmosphere that the Foundation began work to encourage wider participation in humanistic projects, especially in drama. Later, as we shall see, some of this broadening interest was focused through Foundation effort on the characteristics of various regions in the United States. During that period, too, south of the border, assistance was given in countries where the zeal of refugee scholars from old Spain 
combined with the enthusiasm of Latin American humanists, especially in Mexico, to stimulate imaginative work. In post-war years, the foundation gave aid to ventures, both here and abroad, in literary criticism and creative writing. This briefly sketched was the emphasis of the foundation's program in the humanities during the later 30s and the greater part of the 40s, and it was based on the belief that an organization concerned with the well-being of men can scarcely evade the attempt to make people free to share intelligently their cultural inheritance. Above all, this chance should be available to those original minds capable of interpreting their own times to their own contemporaries and to all who come after them. These broad objectives, as in every aspect of the Foundation's program, were out of all proportion to its means. Its hope was that its appropriations might contribute strategically rather than quantitatively to significant trends. 2. If any plan to increase general interest in the humanities... Sorry, in any plan to increase general interest in the humanities, the Foundation felt that drama had a high place, not only for the actors but for the audience. Acted drama, said Stevens, evokes active sharing and experience to a greater degree than any other form of expressive art, making each spectator in his own way a participant in the realities of the illusion. Once the decision was made to enter this field, the foundation again turned to the universities. Following the lead of Professor George Baker, first at Harvard and subsequently at Yale, one American university after another was making provision for the study of drama. Both for graduates and undergraduates, by establishing departments of drama with special facilities for playwriting and production, and with a large measure of freedom from traditional academic restraints. Moreover, a few strong community theatres were demonstrating that regional values in drama were as significant to American life as metropolitan recognition of exceptional abilities. The Foundation, therefore, began its work in these university and community centres by making grants to foster playwriting, to train directors and other specialists, and to develop techniques. At Yale, for example, funds were given for research in such matters as stage lighting, as well as for bringing together a master collection of photographs showing the settings of European and American plays from the year 1500 to the present day. Nearly 60,000 photographs gathered in the United States and from 10 European countries were arranged and documented for use. At the University of Iowa, Foundation Funds aided the completion of a theatre building of advanced design and brought new staff members to the department. In North Carolina, where the university was doing work of high standard throughout the state, the foundation helped to increase its extension programs in drama for high schools and for two community centres. Community pageants and state folk festivals were organised and dramatic study became a fully recognised credit course in the high schools. On Roanoke, I'll, Roanoke, Roanoke in Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, we just disconnected. Come on, OBS. We're back. Are we back? Okay, we're back. Something about Ohio, wasn't it? In Cleveland, Ohio, the foundation found conditions ripe for the parallel development of university and community drama. Western Reserve University, where graduate work of excellent quality had been developed, uh, was providing advisory service to high schools, social settlements, and other groups. The Cleveland Playhouse, one of the most successful community theatres in the country, had a large subscribing membership to support its full-time repertory company. The foundation first took the exceptional step of helping the Playhouse to remove a mortgage so that the income thus saved could be applied to teaching. This benefited the 35 apprentices who came to the Playhouse each year from all parts of the country and opened up wider facilities to the advanced students of the university. At the university, foundation funds were given first to strengthen the staff and later to provide the faculty with adequate workshops as well as a theatre for their teaching. Sums were also given to, the uni to other universities for strengthening the teaching staffs, both for equipment as well as for projects. 
in, o- in order to demonstrate the effectiveness of university drama in state programs of secondary education. The principle of the wide use of plays in education through travelling companies has now been definitely accepted. And in many parts of the country, high school audiences as well as the general public are seeing, often for the first time, performances of Shakespeare and other classic and romantic productions. Thus, in the state of Washington, in a single year, audiences totaling nearly 70,000 saw the comedy of errors and no more frontiers. And the experiment was hailed in the realms of both the theatre and education as one of the most significant developments in the field of either in a generation. In carrying on its work in this area, the Foundation utilised the services of two organisations interested in drama, the National Theatre Conference and the Authors League of America, both of which were active in aiding young playwrights and directors. The conference is a cooperative group made up of the directors of community, college and university theatres. The League, through its subsidiary organisation, the Dramatists Guild, has had a wide influence in affecting better relations between the commercial and non-commercial theatrical fields. To the National Theatre Conference, the foundation gave long-continued help which enabled it to extend to schools, colleges and community groups its services in developing educational and creative values through drama. During the years of this support, interchange between professional and non-profit theatres steadily increased and new plays were frequently released simultaneously in both types. Mutual help was derived from the interchange of personnel for special projects and the educational standing of drama was improved in colleges and universities. To both the the National Theatre Conference and the Authors League of America, the Foundation made extensive grants for fellowships, supplementing its own work in this direction. Over a period of 15 years, The three organisations together awarded nearly 100 fellowships, most of them to younger men and women of promise who needed a year in which to put to application in writing the outcomes of their formal training or a final period of apprenticeship in direction or stage design. The appointments included men who subsequently won conspicuous success, Tennessee Williams, for example, and Lemuel Ayers, Ayers, the stage designer, and E.P. Conkle, best known for his prologue to glory, and the late Thomas Job, author of Uncle Harry. Former Rockefeller Fellows in drama are also to be found today in the departments of a dozen American universities and in many of the community theatres. It is this investment in young people which has helped to bring vitality and imagination to American dramatic writing and to the American stage. 3. The history of culture and institutions in the United States has been, for many years, a relatively neglected field. Whole aspects of American life and tradition are only now beginning to be explored at all adequately. Subjects such as economic, social and intellectual history, the history of science, medicine and technology, as well as of art, music and drama, As yet, only a beginning has been made in the study of the rich regional cultures which nourish whatever national culture today exists in the United States and Canada. No nation which does not understand its past can manage its future. Study is needed of the basis of our American habits and traditions, a wider knowledge of who we are and where and what we came from, a fuller interpretation of American life to enable us to comprehend what we possess today and on what our tomorrow can be built. Excuse me, just needed a sip there. An interest of this kind involves no narrow nationalistic aim. Oh no, we can't have nationalism, can we? The culture of one world, ah, the culture of one world in the making is necessarily compounded of the diverse contributions of many peoples. Until a nation understands itself in relation to its own culture, it cannot intelligently harmonize and integrate its life into the larger pattern. Curious uh, little bit there, isn't it? Trying to find my uh, sticky tabs. Yeah, don't know where they are. Oh, ha ha, here we go. I'm going to tab this page up because that little bit we just read 
Uh, they want to get rid of nationalism and it's the culture of one world in the making. And uh, that's what it's all about, isn't it? It's this one world. It's this uh, stamping out of differences and make it all the same. So that all the hospitals everywhere teach Rockefeller medicine and all the uh, schools teach Rockefeller history and all the TV stations and radios broadcast Rockefeller approved and all the libraries have Rockefeller books and so on and so forth. So interesting that they even got into drama and, and, and funded the teaching of drama. Cause yeah, why is drama in schools? You know, that is quite interesting, but we had drama when we were in school. <laughs> Beginning in 1942, on the initiative of the Foundation, a series of conferences of scholars, writers, critics, and journalists was held to test the feasibility and validity of this general thesis. Each of these conferences represented a special region, such as the Connecticut Valley, the Great Plains, and the maritime and industrial areas of Northeast Canada and New England. The aim of these meetings was to elicit ideas and collaboration in an approach to a deeper and more general understanding of our local cultures, an approach which would give vitality to public education and a sense of significance to American studies among scholars. It was hoped, too, that through regional studies, new source materials might be uncovered and a new impetus developed for constructive, generally interpretive pictures of American life, the conference on the Great Plains area brought together professors of history from the universities of Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Minnesota, Texas, and Wisconsin. Professors of English from the universities of Oklahoma and Texas, as well as journalists and local writers. The one thing that all had in common was a deep interest in their region. One of the journalists later wrote a review of a conference he attended in which he said, quote, we must preserve every scrap of our history in which is recorded the story of how we came to be what we are. We must encourage every interpreter of that history, for outside of our borders and even within them, there is a strange lack of information about its details, a stranger lack of comprehension of its meaning. We must acknowledge the dignity and importance of what the artist, the playwright, the poet, the musician is doing, when he takes his theme from some perhaps small aspect of American life with which he is familiar. We must value the folk arts and handicraft which people from other countries have brought to us and which we have in the past been inclined to reject. It was this spirit which launched the foundation on its program in regional studies. For the most part, it concentrated its support on interpretive studies which tend to lend form and relevance to what is known. Thus, a sum was given to the Texas State Historical Association to enable that organization to make grants in aid to men and women working on the interpretation of the Southwest. Another grant to the to University of Wisconsin contributed towards studies of the process of the transformation of Wisconsin from a wilderness lightly tied to Western civilization to a highly developed and integrated segment of American life. Still another grant to the University of Oklahoma provided for a system of fellowships administered by the university as a stimulus to academic and non-academic writers on regional subjects. An appropriation was also made to the Huntington Library of Pasadena for studies of the culture of the Pacific Southwest region, including South Southern California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. The spirit in which this grant was administered is indicated by the set of principles adopted by the library staff. First, the study shall not be parochial, provincial, or antiquarian in character. Second, it shall provide the basic materials for an understanding of the contemporary economic, social, and cultural development of the Southwest. Finally, it shall seek to show the place of the Southwest in the life and service of the nation. The Foundation also made appropriations, among others, to the University of Utah for studies of the Mormon area, to the University of Alberta for interpretations of the traditions of Canada's youngest province, to the University of Saskatchewan for work in Western Canadian history, and to the University of New Brunswick for interpretive studies of its own area. So 
so it's investing all this money in helping people understand their local area with a view to helping them integrate into the one world. <laughs> Makes sense. Maybe they're investing into studying and getting a, an idea of these differences so that they know how better to undermine them and how better to, or where the resistance is going to come from if they do try and roll certain things out or, or to help them better plan how to undermine in each area the differences, uh, the different characters and, and behaviors and mentalities that they're going to come up against. An appropriation of $100,000, which the foundation made to the Library of Congress, enabled that organization to give grants in aid to workers in the field of biography, folklore, and history interpretation who were not sponsored, who were not sponsored by universities or other educational or scholarly institutions. Similar grants to the Newbury Library of Chicago and to the University of Minnesota served the purpose of creating centers to which gifted students of Midwestern culture could turn for timely aid. That these studies produced more than books may be illustrated by the remark of a listener following an address by the director of the Newberry Library. Quote, I never knew history was like that. I never knew that the Midwest had a history. I thought history was Bunker Hill and Plymouth Rock and George Washington. Assistance to American studies was by no means limited to the regional approach. Some subjects have an interpretive significance broader than any particularized area, and this significance was recognized by the foundation in a number of major grants, as, for example, those to support the research of Dumas Malone on the biography of Thomas Jefferson, or to the Abraham Lincoln Association to produce a definitive text in the, of the works of Lincoln. Throughout this period, too, the foundation sought opportunities to support the development of American studies in colleges and universities. At Princeton, for example, aid was given to an interdepartmental approach to an understanding of American tradition and American contemporary life, an approach which involved the departments of art, archaeology, economics, politics, English, history, and philosophy. Similar work was undertaken in other institutions. As might be expected, the immediate result of this wide and varied support in American studies has been a flood of books, literally scores of them, factual and interpretive, many of them original and imaginative, based on the ingredients of American cultural history. A few of them have found their way to bestseller lists. Most of them have thrown new light on the significance and meaning of American tradition and outlook in the life of today and tomorrow. It would be in invidious to single out the achievements of any one of these writers for special praise, but for perhaps the following list of a few titles will serve to indicate the high quality of the product. Midwest at Noon by Graham Hutton, America's Daughter by Era Bell Thompson, The Old Northwest by R.C. Bewley, William Allen White's America by Walter Johnson, Small Town Renaissance by Richard Waverley Poston, Frontier Justice by Wayne Gard, the Indians of the Southwest by Edward Everett Dale, Oklahoma Footloose and Fancy Free by Angie Debo, America's Heartland the Southwest by Green Payton, Dixie Frontier by Everett Newfound Dick, Wisconsin is My Doorstep by Robert E. Gard, Maria the Potter of San Ildefonso by Alice Marriott. It is a significant fact that interest in American history and culture is developing in European institutions. Late in the 40s, the foundation made provision for visits to the United States and Canada of a number of foreign scholars responsible for North American studies in their universities. In addition, grants were made to Cambridge, Oslo, Uppsala and Munich for working collections of books needed by these scholars and their students. That the inauguration of American studies abroad may in turn have a salutary effect upon such studies in the United States is not beyond the limits of possibilities. 4. The years following 1937 were marked by a new interest in Latin American studies. Not only was the United States government encouraging cultural relations with countries to the south, but scholars in many of the universities were anxious to extend interests beyond their narrow limits of anthropology, archaeology and colonial history, which had largely monopolized their established courses. 
In line with this movement toward the consideration of Latin America as an area, a lively interest was developing in the current art and literature of countries of South America, and the Foundation's program was launched on a favourable tide. The work began with a survey by the American Council of Learned Societies, whose committees, over the past 30 years, have broken ground in some of the most important activities undertaken in the field of humanities. The participation of the Foundation took the form, at first, of encouraging the programs of Latin American studies in some of the universities in the United States as well as, its, as in centres like the Pan American Union and the Hispanic Foundation of the Library of Congress. This support included the allocation of funds for accumulating the necessary materials of research and was followed by a wide extension of fellowships both to American and Latin American scholars sending the former to the southern hemisphere and bringing the latter up to the north. So again, it's that exchanging and blending of cultures to, to water them down. Some of these fellowships helped to develop. They did the, they did the same thing with uh, doctors, didn't they? In the earlier chapters about um, funding medicine in different places around the world and bringing their doctors over to America, or training them up, sending them back to train up the next generations in their home country. Some of these fellowships helped to develop teachers of methods in learning English and Spanish, not teachers of the languages, but specialists in method. Other fellowships and grants served to, int to introduce modern library administration and archival reform in Argentina, Chile, Brazil, Peru, Colombia, Mexico, Venezuela, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. Through minor grants and fellowships, museums were also assisted in Rio de Janeiro and Bahia, two in Mexico City and one in Guatemala, the new National Museum. But it was in Mexico that the foundation made its most extensive Latin American grants in the humanities to support the basic work of two outstanding centers, the National Institute of Archaeology and History and the College of Mexico, and to help the development of philosophy at a third, the National University. The Institute is a semi-autonomous federal agency charged with the custody of the nation's pre-Columbian and colonial monuments. It has become a centre of international training and research and its work in archaeology and anthropology, generously supported by the government, has given it a distinguished position in the Western Hemisphere. The Foundation's association with the Institute was confined to its educational and research functions, supplying fellowships to enable students from other Latin American countries to come there, assisting in development of the library and archives, and providing for visiting professors in anthropology and related subjects. Even more important, wrote Stevens in 1947, are the international effects that are following the close collaboration among the countries now benefited by the work of the Institute. It has, ma it has made their common possession of Mayan, Aztec and contemporary Indian cultures a means of intellectual cooperation. The College of Mexico, founded in the 30s of this century, is a research centre for the development of specialists in history, literary criticism, language and economic studies. It has demonstrated the intellectual allegiances of old Spain and the New World, first by using distinguished refugee scholars and then by joining with the Institute of Archaeology and History to give a balanced training in both Spanish and Latin American literatures. The Foundation's support was for fellowships, historical studies and Latin American linguistics. The modest grants in philosophy which the Foundation gave to the National University were stimulated in part by the presence of refugee scholars and by the fact that philosophy is an active discipline in Latin America. The, result, the resulting publications have influenced the program of the newly organized Inter-American Philosophical Association, which had been effective in securing cooperation among philosophers of North and South America. In all this activity, it must be recognized that historically and culturally, Latin America has closer ties with Europe than with the United States, there is a very genuine basis, however, for a wider common understanding. Not only do North, Central and South America occupy one hemisphere, but all of the peoples in that hemisphere have recently faced, or are still facing, pioneer conditions. All of them are inheritors and trustees of fresh lands and vast nat natural resources. Compared with the older European civilizations, 
the nations of the Western Hemisphere are perhaps freer from tradition and readier for new experiments in cultural living. In any event, the opportunity for interchange between the nations of North and South America is obvious, and the possibilities that may come out of this development in terms not only of sympathetic understanding, but of a new and more vital cultural life seem to be real and tangible. Five, a frequent criticism of current humanistic study is aimed at its preoccupation with factual research, new fields of facts to conquer, new puzzles for scholarship to unravel, new opportunities to correct a text or discover a parallel. Henry Seidel Canby, in an address before the Modern Language Association, described the humanistic scholar in these words, quote, Unconsciously, he has left the difficult and doubtful ranges of interpretation, of appreciation, of valuation, all involving the never-to-be-entirely-calculable human spirit, and has thrown the emphasis more and more on fact-finding, on the material background of human experience, upon the search for the last detail of accurate knowledge. He has become more accurate and more knowledgeable than his predecessors, and this is good, but somehow, somewhere, the precious and nourishing liquid of literature has been spilled from the ever more carefully moulded goblet. While Mr. Camby's comment was directed largely to literature, it is undoubtedly applicable to other disciplines, and its validity, in some respects at least, must be reorganised. Oh, sorry, must be recognised. In the two decades of its operation in the humanistic field, the Foundation, through its fellowships and grants in aid, has attempted in so far as possible to meet the situation by a careful screening of personnel. During this period, its fellowships have been awarded to more than 500 men and women selected by officers of the Humanities Division. In addition to these, 735 fellows were appointed by outside institutions, notably the American Council of Learned Societies, with funds provided by the Foundation. For these two types of fellowships, more than $2.5 million was appropriated. The scholars who had this support have worked in literature and philology, oriental studies, history, archaeology, philosophy, art, architecture, and a dozen other subjects. Probably some of their work has been profitless, a piling of fact upon fact, with little relation to the values needed by our times. But who can tell in advance the scholar from the pedant? or who can determine the kind of intellectual and cultural soil out of which creativeness, imagination and great teaching will spring. Meanwhile, it can be recorded that of the scores of scholars who receive support from the Foundation, not a few have become the interpreters of their generation, bringing to life in contemporary language what is relevant in the stream of human culture. A more direct and ambitious attempt to stimulate the creative spirit in the field of literature was made by the Foundation in financing. In 1945, the Atlantic Awards, administered by the University of Birmingham in England to help promising young British writers dislocated and exhausted as a result of the war by giving them a year or two of freedom from the pressure of making a living. As of this writing, 47 men and women have received this type of aid, 27 novelists and short story writers, 17 poets, and 3 dramatists. It is perhaps too soon to assess the ultimate value of this project, but in a recent statement, the Birmingham Committee of Awards reported that several of them, the authors, are building up for themselves a high reputation. And the committee added this interpretation of the project, the war killed many men, and with them, no doubt, many good books. That loss is irretrievable. But help can be given, in time of peace, to those young writers who are threatened by inimical forces, which, if less immediately apparent and less tangible, are as likely as war itself to stultify and ultimately to destroy their talents. A similar purpose was implicit in an action taken by the Foundation with relation to young American writers. Instead of fellowships, however, the Foundation made grants to three periodicals which encourage literary excellence and provide media for the publication of new writings. The Kenyan Review, the Sewanee Review, and the Pacific Spectator. The funds were given to enable these periodicals to raise their rates of payment to authors from the starvation scale called nominal to a scale that was regarded as reasonable. In effect, 
The grants were subsidies to younger writers who established their claim to such assistance by securing the publication of their material in magazines that maintained superior literary standards. Of course, the maintenance in a society of creative work of high level involves much more than the support of the writer or artist himself. His apparent problems are really the problems of the role and acceptance of humanism in a civilization. Problems that no single organization, least of all a foundation, can effectively solve. Although single organizations can help in small ways in establishing more favorable conditions. Six. The Foundation's program in the humanities, like the programs of other divisions of its work, was purposely kept elastic and flexible in order to meet unanticipated needs and opportunities. Consequently, some projects are not easily classifiable under the headings of the regular program and are therefore mentioned in the paragraphs which follow. Philosophy. A familiar passage in Bacon's Advancement of Learning refers to the three parts of man's understanding which is the seat of learning, history to his memory, poesy to his imagination, and philosophy to his reason. In our times, philosophy needs recognition and fortunately is beginning to receive it. If there can be a return to reason, from which, in Hog Hogben's phrase, man is in retreat, the other parts of Bacon's definition can take their accustomed places and contribute to our understanding, each in its own way. As we have seen, philosophy is an active discipline in Latin America, and the foundation facilitated the visits of several scholars to the United States, where they exchanged views with their American associates and lectured at various colleges and universities, Aid was also given to the American Philosophical Association for a series of public forums in seven cities to discuss with teachers, ministers, lawyers and other laymen the meanings of philosophy in modern times and its place in American life and institutions. Out of these forums came the book Philosophy in American Education, Its Tasks and Opportunities. A summer session in philosophy and an international congress of philosophers designed to promote the exchange of ideas between East and West, were assisted in 1948 by the Foundation through a grant to the University of Hawaii. The Foundation aided directly a number of outstanding scholars in philosophy, of whom perhaps three may be mentioned as examples. Dr. Hu Shi, to enable him to continue his history of Chinese philosophy. Dr. Charles Morris of the University of Chicago, whose books... Signs, Language and Behaviour and The Open Self have given him a leading place in American philosophy. And Dr. Baker Brownell of Northwestern University, whose book The Human Community, its philosophy and practice for a time of crisis, started as a project in the Foundations program in regional studies, but developed into an outstanding analysis of the relation of philosophy to the contemporary world. Another grant by the Foundation to the Aspen, Colorado Congress for the Goeth Bicentennial Celebration was made with the primary aim of bringing Albert Schweitzer from his African responsibilities to a place where his unique personality and point of view could be more widely appreciated. The impact of his extraordinary career as philosopher, musician and spiritual leader is already beginning to influence the thinking of this generation. The Berkshire Music Center the Foundation never developed a program in music for two reasons. It had no staff qualified for activity in this field, and in the second place, other organizations designed for this particular purpose were doing effective work. An exception was made in connection with the Berkshire Music Center, established by the late Dr. Serge Kuzevitsky, the brilliant conductor of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, in connection with the annual Berkshire Music Festival. The centre, which was launched by a grant from the Foundation, is a training school for musicians, with courses for orchestral conductors, composers and singers. The faculty consists mainly of the front desk players of the Boston Orchestra, and the six-week session includes, at the end, the three weeks of the festival, attendance of which is the privilege of all the pupils of the centre. Three excellent young conductors, Thor Johnson, Leonard Bernstein and the Brazilian Carvalho, now successfully launched in their profession, are already the fruit of Dr. Kuzovitsky's teaching, and Berkshire has become established as an internationally recognized music center of high importance. The American Council of Learned Societies 
No adequate story of the Foundation's work in the humanities could fail to mention the significant part played by the American Council of Learned Societies. Organized in 1919 and patterned on the National Research Council, its membership includes the foremost learned societies concerned with humanistic studies, such as the American Historical Association, the American Philosophical Society, the Modern Language Association of America, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, to mention only four out of 23. The Council's activities embrace a wide field, including major projects like the Dictionary of American Biography and the Linguistic Atlas of the United States and Canada, assistance to individual scholars through fellowships and grants in aid, and the stimulation through special committees of experts of new areas of study. Thus, committees have been established not only in major cultural areas, Chinese, Japanese, Indic and Iranian, Arabic and Islamic, Slavic and Latin American, but on subjects such as musicology, the history of ideas, American culture and Negro studies. With all this activity, the Rockefeller Foundation has been closely identified. In much of its work, as for example in the handling of part of its fellowship and grant in aid programs, the Council has been the agency through which the operation has been channeled. In addition, the Foundation has contributed to many of the projects of the Council and has made substantial appropriations to its general budget. The relationship has been one of mutual advantage. Certainly without the advice and rich resources of the Council, the Foundation's program in the humanities would have been seriously handicapped. Although late in entering the field of the humanities, the trustees of the Foundation have felt increasingly that in a world where the values by which men have guided and still guide their lives are in constant danger of being submerged, no area of activity has greater significance. Like the social sciences, it is an area of imponderables and, even more than in the social sciences, satisfactory methods of measuring results cannot easily be established. Moreover, it is a difficult area to cultivate, and the determination of what is relevant to the deep needs of our time is often a baffling task. The choices of approach by any one organisation are by no means infallible. Mistakes are inevitable, and disappointments are not infrequent. But for over two decades, the Foundation has maintained its faith in this general line of attack and has supported it with substantial appropriations. And that is the end, chapter 20, Humanism as an Interpreter. And you can see there, the next chapter, a little uh, preview, is going to be Investment in Leadership. That'll be coming up on Thursday night. And then after that, we've got Throughout the World. So Thursday night, 7 o'clock UK time for those. I'm just going to have a sip and then we'll look at the comments and then we'll wrap it up, I think. Ooh, that was uh, a little drier than I expected it to be. And uh, still, though, it, it's just it's, it's just incredible how far reaching their investments were. Everything from radio to television to playwrights to archaeology. They're putting money into libraries, into uh, they're helping libraries store up those books. They're putting money into universities, um, music program there at the end. I think Leonard Bernstein was the only name that I re that I recognized. Uh, but the other thing I'm going to look up is where it was talking about Birmingham and how they were giving scholarships out to uh, authors and writers here in England. So that's something I also want to look into because, you know, I'm from England. I might have heard of some of those. I felt like what was really missing from those last two chapters were, were examples of the kind of, of content that were being put out and they were being funded, you know. Um, that that would have been the juicy kind of information from my point of view. I would like to know, you know, are they funding uh, people who are doing absurd kind of plays? You know, what's the, is it Thomas Beckett? I read a bit of Thomas Beckett at university and, you know, there's this whole play about two guys who are waiting for a third guy to show up and the third guy never shows up. And just really like nihilistic, absurd, meaningless kind of 
nonsense stuff and then and then they, it gets written and then you know it gets pushed as though it's artistically valuable in some way and then you get and then you kind of brainwash students by getting them to read this nonsense and then they feel like idiots when they say well this is crap i don't like it and it doesn't make any sense right <laughs> so uh waiting for godot yeah that's it gwen that's the one uh just just silly nonsense, right? So I, I would have liked to have known, maybe had more names there. They did give us some names at least, uh, but maybe have some more names to look into, the writers and the, the the genres, I suppose, just to know what it is, what aspect are they funding. Um, and I, I, was, I was expecting a little more of a comment on humanism because I know that's a thing, but I don't know that much about it. And uh, those topics, those... Uh, not those topics. Those chapters kind of implied they were going to teach us something about humanism. I'm just going to type it in quickly to Wikipedia and let's see what comes up. Humanism is a philosoph philosophical stance that emphasizes the individual and social potential and agency of human beings, who it, whom it considers the starting point for serious moral and philosophical inquiry. Yeah, so this is kind of coming out. This is coming out. Uh, yeah, during the Age of Enlightenment. And this is coming out of uh, of a rejection of uh, other religions, I would have thought. Yeah, yeah. So humanism might be something, might be a little bit for the for the preamble ramble on the next show to have a look at. So we got. Uh, let's have a look. So we added our conversation about English and English uh, accents. Heidi says, "Can you say cultural creation?" Yeah. That was the sense I got as well. A lot of cultural creation, you know. We're going to fund the plays. We're going to fund the. Uh, we're going to control the libraries. We're going to fund the radio and the television. And we're going to study who's listening to the radio and can we make films and get them out there and it, it drama. Yeah, the drama aspect as well. So Heidi said, drama is storytelling, which is the most powerful art form. Yeah, because a story can get in in your mind, can't it? And that can hook you. And people follow a story much more readily most of the time than facts and figures and, and this kind of thing so just look at how popular soap operas are for example or films you know the marvel films and all that kind of thing it's very uh alluring and addictive and we always keep going back to stories and even though i've seen so many films that now pretty much every film i watch i know where it's going to go because there's only so many plot arcs and, and story arcs that you can get uh you know there's only so many you can do and once you've seen enough films, you can kind of go, oh, that's going to go here and then that's going to go. And, and, and you can just see the, the pattern very early on. Um, so that was a good point. Yeah. Funding the drama and then making sure the drama, you know, and 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 uh, emphasizing certain plays over others and getting people to, you know, that thing I just said about pushing something that's really nonsense, garbage, and just sort of pretending that it's art. And then saying, oh, no, it's fantastic. You just don't understand it because you're an idiot. You know, <laughs> I think there's quite a bit of that happens. And I'd be interested to know if their money and their funding had some alignment with the sort of debasing of the culture in, 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 in any way. Peter, good evening, sir. Once again, always this way. They always invest, invest. And then uh, we got a, yeah, Bill and Melinda Foundation, large single owner of farmer in the United States, definitely in the United States. I'm not sure about the world, Peter. Someone else will have to answer that question for you. All right. I think that is it for this evening. I'm getting a bit sleepy. I'm ready for bed. That was a long one. So thank you for hanging in there and sticking with me. Uh, I'm uh, going to wrap this up for now. Like I said, we've got four chapters left and then we're done. Uh, so I just showed you their investment in leadership and throughout the world. The last two chapters are the evolution of principles and practice and perspective. So actually, now that I'm looking at it, we've got 289. We've only got, but there's actually only about 40 pages left, maybe a bit over 40. So we might do it all on Thursday. We'll see how we get on, right? Uh, we might just be wrapping it up on Thursday. So don't forget, we've got the, um, let me go back here and, and show you one more time. We've got the poll, which is now open here in, in the Telegram group linked under the description box. It might have changed. I took this before the broadcast started. That was three hours ago, so it might have changed by now. Uh, but these are the three books, Roads by Sarah Gertrude Millen from 1933, 
We've got Rockefeller Internationalist, the man who misrules the world. And we've got Fabian Freeway. Uh, all good stuff. All interesting stuff. And I think um, if you want to get your say in, get onto the Telegram group and um, put in your vote. Get involved. That's what it's all about. And so I think we're going to put this down here and then we'll wrap it up. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, another successful broadcast, I think. I hope that was useful and edifying. And uh, it was kind of dry. Not too many big, juicy gold nuggets and revelations in that one. But, you know, you can't, uh, you got to go through the boring stuff sometimes. And still just so, 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 so amazing that they're even funding that. I was expecting this to be a lot more uh, medical focused. And we got a lot of that at the beginning. And now we're just getting all the other stuff. And, you know, there's hardly anything they didn't pour money into. <laughs> so we'll see what kind of leadership, uh, which leaders they were funding and, and propping up and, and, and throwing money at in the next chapter, which is going to be on Thursday at 7 p.m. Uh, so thank you all for being here. Take care of yourselves. Enjoy the rest of the evening. What day is it? It's Tuesday. Enjoy your Wednesday. And hopefully we'll see you all on Thursday. And until then, God bless.